Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. It's John Suntress with a few show notes before we get started. Uh, as always, thank you very much for listening to the commercials. I know they can be frustrating, but it helps pay the bills here at Word Balloon. Thank you greatly for uh, doing that. It's a big way of supporting the show by just listening and being patient through a couple ads. And Sometimes they repeat those ads. I, I have no control over that. That's uh, from my network speaker, and I appreciate uh, the fact that they've been giving me these ads to run. Uh, also, uh, new Word Balloon videos up, if you didn't see them already. Uh, two panels from C2E2. And then, unfortunately, a discussion about the coronavirus and its impact on Comic-Cons with uh, Ithacon organizer Ed Cato. So check those out. Go to the Word Balloon channel right there on YouTube, and you'll be able to see them. Questions or comments about the show, john at wordballoon.com. You can email me there. Thank you greatly. Word Balloon is brought to you by alexrossart.com. Alex has been a longtime sponsor of Word Balloon. I greatly appreciate it. you got to go to his website. You will find tremendous art from original work, covers, pages, fantastic lithographs, amazing posters. Every price point is covered, and every subject is covered at alexrossart.com. You've enjoyed his iconic looks at DC and Marvel, but also great stuff like his wonderful work on the monkeys, Monty Python, so many other great pop culture things that Alex has put his fingerprints on. His wonderful Flash Gordon poster that evokes the fantastic Dino De Laurentiis, Sam Jones movie. Recently, Alex did things like uh, the timeless Marvel covers featuring great solo shots of all your favorite Marvel heroes. And of course, his Fantastic Four full circle graphic novel still available. All waiting for you now at alexrossart.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Sutter is here. Nice, easy conversation with Jerry Ordway, as they usually are. You know, Jerry, a wonderful artist, whether it was All-Star Squadron with Roy Thomas or his incredible run on Superman uh, that, uh, man, I I don't know how many years it was in total, but he was part of the uh, burn revamp of Superman and then... uh, you know, kept things going after Byrne left and not only was uh, drawing Superman, but writing Superman as well. We have a great conversation today about a lot of different subjects. Uh, among them, we had been meaning to talk uh, really through the end of the year about uh, the Batman 89 comic as it was celebrating its 30th anniversary. And uh, we got on into that. Uh, you know, uh, how did uh, Jack Nicholson feel about his likeness in the film? We also talk about the Joker film itself and uh, upcoming collaborations with P. Craig Russell. Uh, We also talk about uh, the recent Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover uh, covers that he did um, to, uh, you know, celebrate the CW crisis. It uh, it was a product that was uh, released in Walmart Books and also uh, for the direct marketing. He talks about the covers that he made for that. But this goes in a lot of different areas and uh, past runs that he had, uh, old uh, comic book history and uh, upcoming projects as well. Real fun conversation today with uh, Jerry Ordway talking about a lot of different things. Kind of reminds me of the same conversation I had with Dave Gibbons in terms of all the different directions that we went into. I think you're going to like it. Jerry Ordway for a couple hours sitting down and having fun. And we need a lot of fun in uh, this current environment, don't we? On today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, Greatly League, for your support via Patreon. It means a lot. Uh, You're helping to keep the lights on here at Word Balloon. And uh, again, I keep trying to expand with more and more product. In fact, this very interview with Jerry Ordway, uh, the stuff about the Batman 89 comic I've made into a YouTube video. It's sitting on the uh, YouTube uh, channel for Word Balloon right now. But uh, this is a much longer conversation. But uh, I thank you greatly for your support and uh, your listening. Word Balloon listeners, thank you very much. All right, let's get into it now. Fun conversation with Jerry Ordway. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, of course, as, as always, you know, nice pleasantries. Uh, we were just getting started, but then we found ourselves immediately in a, in a riff that I wanted to include. So uh, you, you missed Jerry asking me how I'm doing uh, because I didn't start the recording until I started giving him my answer. And that's where we begin this conversation with the great Jerry Ordway on today's Word Balloon. Okay, good enough, you know. Um, <laughs> I-, good, I like that good enough is... <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I, uh, I, a DJ buddy of mine, we always would say, I ah, good enough for rock and roll. It's like, close enough, <laughs> you know. At a certain age, good enough is fine. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. See, and again, given our age, you'll appreciate 
how much of a loser I am. I was watching, and you know, I got work done and had some downtime, watching uh, a bit of uh, Richard Pryor's uh, Brewster's Millions movie. Remember that? Oh, yep, with John Candy, right? Yep, 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 yep. I heard an old time radio version of it with Jack Benny from like Lux yeah, Radio was, Theater or whatever. Yeah, I think it was one of those that was, wasn't it like a 1930s movie or something that they'd remade? I know That's it was a remember. play. And I don't yeah, know. No, if, it was a, you know, it was a movie. Yeah, well, it was a movie. Okay, and I don't know yeah. who's in the original movie. I've just heard the old time radio Jack Benny uh, version. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, we wish we had. The, in a way, you always think about those. Uh, we, what would you do if you had that money? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, but I mean, it's you know, not a, not a great movie. Although Jack Candy's funny and everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's you know during Richard Pryor's. Well, grab the check uh, period, and that's what are you gonna do? <clears throat> Wasn't that around? Uh, that was probably what I, I always think of when I think of Richard Pryor. It's weird to think about. I always think of Blazing Saddles because he was supposed to be in it, and he I think right. he pulled out. And, well, uh, he was part of the writing. I think he actually helped write that he, screenplay. He, he was. He was one of the the four or five writers on the movie. Um, the way Mel Brooks tells it, um, the studio wasn't willing to insure him because. They knew he was a big drug guy, and and you know they thought he was too controversial to be the star yeah. and everything. But I gotta say, Cleveland, Cleveland Little, you know, yeah, he was good. He it was, was great. I mean, it, he made it his part and stuff. That yeah. it's just funny to think about it in in relation to a what could have been because sure. I mean, Richard Pryor, you know, Pryor did some nice uh, uh, films, but a lot of like you said, the the era of making right. the. Big bucks, and yeah, you can't blame somebody for that either. Oh, no, That's, no, no, I, and I it's understand. It's like you, you're you're suddenly given those keys to the kingdom, and you're like, hey, if someone's going to be paying me this much, sure, I'll do this, I'll do that. And well, and you'd you think know. actually, Brewster's Millions is a good story, and yeah. that it, you know, and I mean, it's I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just you know the the fact that it's the eighties. I don't remember seeing it in the theater, but I know I saw it on cable. Yeah, well, you remember the the movies he did with. Um, Gene Wilder, oh, he did the, and it's funny because I think I saw something pop up on cable. I think it was the Silver Streak. Okay, where they were it was the train one. I don't know if you remember. Oh, that. Absolutely, was, no. I'm a I'm a Gene big Wilder's fan of on the this. run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny how politically incorrect. It oh is. God, yes. <laughs> God, yes. Oh my God. Seriously, no, you're right, you, man. No, nowadays a, they can do so much more, but yet they can do so much less in in kind of being, I guess, a little more bold, <laughs> you know. I'm with you. No, no, no. Absolutely. Is it okay to keep all this? Because this was a great opening. Oh, yeah. and this is, all right, yeah, excellent. Yeah. All right, now let me say, Jerry Ordway, welcome back to Word Balloon. It's always a pleasure. You know that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I know. <it's, laughs> could, it, could it be a less warm welcome? <laughs> it's like I got it's a clipboard. Winter. I'm taking the census, actually, Jerry. How many, How many people, people are in the house? In the house? Two. Exactly. All right, there you go. <laughs> Fine. Excellent. That's a good way to do it. You could be the uh, you know the podcast uh, census taker. This is, this You're is probably more accurate. <laughs> yeah, really. I know. Good lord, I, I can only imagine what what number. Uh, apparently, there's uh, 300 people. We're done. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Good job. Anyway. Yeah. This- <laughs> yeah I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to go make a left turn because we could we could spend two hours talking about this. <laughs> But I wanted to say, and I, I also wanted to understand, because I saw that great sketch that you did um, uh, cover for um, Crisis on Infinite Earths, the tie-in to the CW TV thing. Mm-hmm. And was that, what What was that a cover to? Uh, I did two of them. It was, they did two, DC did two um, Crisis TV tie-ins with uh, Walmart. And then they also, I guess because they took heat from having original content go into Walmart and not to the comic store, so the ones I did the covers for are the direct market ones. So, oh, wow. I think they, they, they were in Walmart with George Perez, kind of reused original cover, crisis covers. Um, and then like a month later, the direct market one, like the first one I did with the Arrowverse heroes and Flash and stuff, you know, in the foreground looking up at the infinite earths being destroyed or whatever that yeah. one came out on Jan- i think january 15th and i think the second one with the anti-monitor uh comes out i think maybe towards the end of february i don't think it's 
clearly it wasn't this week, but maybe next week. Okay. And uh, um, but those are you know they're kind of nice. Again, the, the yeah. DC DC has been doing a lot of original content for Walmart, but right. I think, you know again a lot of those Walmart books are hard to find. And yeah. Someone goes in and buys up all ten copies at some store and puts them on eBay for twice the cover price. Well, you know that doesn't give you readers. That just makes people mad. <laughs> no, you're right about that. And they finally did uh, re- start releasing um, the Walmart stuff. Was it? Yeah. yeah, it was the Walmart stuff in, in the direct market because yeah, yeah. There's know, like can't... a couple of them each month. I think that come out yeah. now. That yeah, and actually you're right. I mean, I focused on on King's Tom King's uh, Superman story with Kubert and also. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bendis' Nick Darrington story, the Batman story. So, yeah, yeah. You know. And it's funny, too, because certainly, I mean, I last year, um, actually a full year ago, around now, I did a book. <clears throat> I wrote and drew, I wrote one, I wrote two sto- two ten-page stories and drew one of the two that I wrote. was I did a Wonder Woman and a Joker. <clears throat> I wound up drawing the Wonder Woman and writing it, and the Joker one I just wrote okay. came out as a warm, uh, target exclusive tied to the primal age toys that they were pushing at the time yes, I guess of course the primal age, i thought the primal age toys were really cool yeah <laughs> but you know i guess they they didn't quite have the market uh, strength or whatever but the comic was supposed to be in target exclusively like in january i i didn't actually find one in the wild until somewhere in like maybe march april may okay. even so you know, it's cool that they try to do an outreach thing, but, you know, you deal with the, you know, in the case of Walmart, you're dealing with their employees or their distribution, however they stack the shelves. Totally. Same with the Target thing. So it's while yes. it's a bigger venue, it's not a, a guaranteed easy find for, you know, expanding your readership. No, you're 100% <laughs> right. I have, I have, the closest Walmart I have in the city in Chicago is a, gro- a Walmart grocery store. Mm-hmm. And you know, I asked somebody who worked there, and like, this is a grocery store. I'm like, yeah, I know, but you know, it's supposed to be in all the WalMarts. And she's like, <laughs> looking at me like I'm nuts. And finally, shoved in the corner where they had like uh, batteries on the wall and also right. um, baseball cards and whatever right. you know, trading cards. Right. It was over there, but yeah, I mean, literally, like, not even a full shelf. I mean, it was just so in the corner. Just yeah, whatever. Here it is. Yeah. And, no, and I had it's the same hilarious. I had the same experience locally. I, I don't really there's not a, a Walmart near me, so I was a uh, you know, while I'm out and about it's like, Oh, I'll stop in a Walmart. This is supposed to be out and I asked people, I'd ask the employees, I looked through the store, found nothing. And you know, again, in the old days it's it is the old days, you think about it, but there was always some kind of magazine rack. Yeah, in a drugstore or even a grocery store, there's a rack of magazines, sure. or there's, you know, kind of a location where people would look for printed material where you could sometimes find comics or all the times find comics depending on, you know, the store. So it it does feel like you'd have a, you know, you have to have almost like a dedicated space, which, you know, a lot of the big retailers are probably so inundated with brands and toys and what have you that they, it's like, oh no, not another thing. <laughs> You know or I mean? or do they? And I have no I have no idea how retail works these days. You know, do do the manufacturers of a product or something pay even more? And I'm sure they do. Yeah. To have like oh, yeah. a dedicated you know a dedicated shelf and and be yeah. displayed. Well, I mean, you. One of the things I was I was thinking about in re, in regards to the because we were going to talk about the Batman um, yeah. the movie comic. Well, yeah. One of the things that was part of that whole. You know, adaptation of the uh, movie in '89 was that DC circulation guy um, was Matt Ragone, and Matt worked really hard to get the books on shelves in movie theaters. Like on a, they, we created like a special little cardboard stand. Yes. You know, that the books, and they paid something like five dollars per location to have those stands sitting on a counter. Interesting. And that was the way that worked. You know, that was Smart. the first I'd heard of that. But it was like rather than, even then, they still had, there were still some comic racks and some magazine racks in, in drugstores and stuff. But to have it on the counter, point of purchase, cost you five bucks to put it there. So, isn't it? That was a, yeah, go on. And then, the, I mean, they, they, uh, the movie thing, I, I know they sold a lot of copies of the comic through the movie theaters, but on top of that, the, 
the other retailers sold a lot. It was as a newsstand book for I think it was I want to say it was maybe four ninety five or something. But it right because may, may it been. wasn't it in that Dark Knight uh, prestige format. Yeah, well, they did two. They did one with a regular paper cover, but they were both square bound and stapled. Or right. You know. Oh, okay. So the, the there was a newsstand one, which is a, a a line art cover that I did with the Batman kicking the Joker and kind of like a montage cover that was done on do a shade board in regular comic flat separations, and that was the newsstand one. Then the other one I was doing was the. Uh, the other one is the painted cover was more cardboard, and that was like a bookstore, comic store thing. With with the Joker's head above Batman. And right, right, right. Yeah, see, that's the one I remember, and as yeah. you said, I remember seeing it in uh, bookstores as well. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. I ever saw the uh, the regular floppy one, and that was still... I'm trying to think, because, you know, 89, it would have been for me, and God, once again, let me, let me please, you know, just... Dis- Tell everybody my age and everything, but it's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Um, I was out of college, or it was my last year in college. Might have been my last summer in college, but it was, oh, it was summer of '89. So yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I had just finished college. Maybe I wasn't buying right away, and maybe that is yeah. the only place I saw it was in the in the book. Or you were maybe broke. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was the thing. A comic book at that time. I believe, and again, I'm, I'm going by memory, but 89, maybe they were 50 cents or 40. They, they could have been 50, 60 cents, something like that. Oh, I think. So you're talking oh, about. They weren't a, a dollar yet? They weren't a dollar yet by 89? I don't think so, no. Or maybe they were 70, I don't remember exactly. Or something? I don't have anything sitting in front of me to I'm look up. at. But, no, no. <laughs> but I think in. Uh, you you know, know, they were. Yeah, it was just. It's funny, though, because it's. It, 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 just in relation, when you're asking somebody to buy a movie comic. It was sixty-four pages. It was a, a, you know, more of a premium. Oh uh, yeah, price thing. So, if you were a kid, you know, you always you have a limit to your finances. So, if you're regularly buying ten other comics, how do you find you know, the extra money to buy an, a new one or a different one? So it was it was competitive, very competitive back then. Oh, I totally believe it. And and again, I mean, obviously, it was a huge seller. And the great now you drew it. Who wrote it? Did Denny the write Batman? It? Yeah, Denny adapted the the Sam Ham screenplay, and uh, he uh, he was kind of involved with it, like certainly for less time than than Jonathan Peterson and, and myself. Jonathan was the editor, okay? Because the movie, you know, the movie in itself was there were lots of, lots of things that were kind of rewritten while it was in production. So if we had just stuck with you know the the screenplay, we could have probably started drawing and working on it before we really had any kind of sense of the what the movie was going to look like or whatever but we uh we tried to do as much as we could to stall until we had you know stills and things but even as we were getting them we, we were seeing uh jonathan was like you know he and i were good friends and and we both were big movie buffs so it was a fun project and that way to kind of feel like you're in on the middle of some you know big uh, blockbuster in the making um but we'd we'd get the he'd get these uh, contact sheets and script changes from his contact at Warner Publicity, and they would often be like, "Whoa, they threw out that whole scene! Wow, they did this!" And the, you know, it, it was it was kind of uh, hard to keep up with with it, you know, because at a certain point back then you had to do you had to get books comic books lettered on the actual pages that you were drawing on. So the way we would stall, in a way, like if we didn't, well, we don't have reference for everything, we started out with Denny's script, and I know Denny did some rewrites as well as they got, you know, the movie started changing from the time they started filming it, so so the script had, had already had little changes, but I was able to lay it out really roughly, and then we'd place the word balloons where they were going to go on the panels, but it was really not drawn to any degree, it was just locked in with, you know, stick figures or, or something very simple so that by the time the letterer, John Costanza, finished lettering and I got the, the actual boards to finish, we hoped that we would have reference for stuff or at least have a sense of what certain, you know, locales would, would look like. So, And we did have, you know, good reference for the first part of the movie. Um, that's where the bulk of the reference, the uh, on-set photographer would take, you know, beautiful shots of the sets without actors on them or whatever and then some with the 
while the things were being filmed. Um, I don't even know if they do that anymore. If that's even a, you know what I mean? Oh, I think they thing, do. but I think they but, do because you you always get those giant coffee table movie production yeah, books true. these days. Yeah. So yeah, true. somebody has to be absolutely, and that, that's but, uh, and is and that's part of the that's obviously part of the uh, marketing now. You know, yeah, or another yeah. pro, another uh, after product and everything. Yeah. So like with the Batman thing, there were yeah. you know it there was I, I had at, at a certain point I had these uh, film boxes that were about eight and a half by eleven, about an inch thick. I must have had like five film boxes full of stills, you know, like nice oh, that's uh, great. prints. Most of yeah. them black and white. A couple of them would be color, like if they're main scenes, but nothing. Once the movie start, <laughs> once the movie started changing, there wasn't a lot of of photographic reference for the last half of the movie you know so we would we would get we started getting slides contact sheets of slides like there would be xeroxes of of basically a a contact sheet with slides so they were all really tiny black and white photocopy oh my god yeah really hard but you could at least see oh okay that's what's happening but they weren't as good as for use as reference because you really weren't getting much detail of faces or whatever. Oh yeah, no. If anything, it was just really like almost. Um, oh god, now I'm blanking on your guys' phrase. The breakdown, like a breakdown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you know, the, with the faces, I always thought it was funny sure. that the big challenge with doing that was in a comic book as opposed to a movie, you have a finite number of panels you can fit. So they had a page count of 64 pages, which it was full. I mean, when we the, from the original Denny script. There really wasn't a lot of extra room to move and drop and add stuff. So, but we kept adding stuff. So it just <laughs> made more panels, you know. But with like a, a shot of say a big sequence with the Joker and Bruce Wayne, they would mostly shoot stuff as, you know, Bruce Wayne would cl- get a close up, the Joker would get a, you know, close up. There weren't that many shots where, like in a comic book, you need to have. An over-the-shoulder shot, for example. Mm-hmm. Here's your reaction shot of Bruce Wayne, but Joker's in the foreground, and you're seeing past his ear or something. Yep. Those are the type of, you know, those are bread and butter for comics because you're condensing stuff. So you're taking a, you know, five maybe five, whatever five minute sequence and condensing it to a one page. You need to combine characters into panels so that both of them can talk at the same time. Whereas, like I said, movies, it's all about. You're showing the actors' faces. You're generally showing them from whatever their preferred angle is as well. So you don't really get a lot of, like, you know, you can't do low extreme angles. You know, there's no up-the-nose shot of uh, of Michael Keaton or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just it's just not the type of the same type of mechanics that you would use as a comic artist that you use in a movie because, you know, a comic artist, we're making up the characters or we're drawing them. In a movie, they're paying somebody millions of dollars. So, you know, they want them to look like themselves. They want them to look good. Maybe one guy doesn't want to be shot from the from the right, or you know what I mean. Everybody's got uh, something written in their contract, oh, so, yeah. so it, it would limit the number of angles that I had to choose from. So, if I found an angle, even if it was a tiny shot of the Joker on the street and he's walking away, if you could see a nice shot of the way it, you know his head looked from behind. Well then, heck, I would blow that up, or I would, you know, use that reference for five or ten pages whenever I need a shot because it was the only shot that I had that was good enough to to use as reference. So that's cool. Yeah. Now, was Nick Nicholson was cool with uh, you know using his likeness? I know that a few movie adaptations over the years were uh, for comic books were killed. Yeah. Because the the actors like yeah I don't want that no yeah well <laughs> I know? mean here the, the, it became a actually it's funny because it I think probably the uh, Star Wars and the Indiana Jones and those things probably had more of that licensing actors likenesses and things it it, it it probably became more of a thing because of that so like when Batman came along we knew we'd get we'd have to get likeness approval. And uh, Jonathan, the uh, again, he was really smart about this. He said, there's a way to get approval. It's like a blanket approval, but you have to do an audition. And that was better than, like, say, having to submit pages to the actors, three, you know, three or four different actors' representation right. to get them to sign off when you're really trying to meet a deadline. Because sure. once those pages are done, they want them colored. They want them, you yeah. know. Yeah. So what we did was I did a... Um, probably in February, I would say, of 89. 
before I really started drawing anything. I did audition pages, so I did a full sheet of my 17 of multiple poses of Michael Keaton as Batman, Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne, Jack Nicholson as Jack Napier, Jack Nicholson as the Joker, and then uh, Kim Basinger. Those were the, the three main ones I had to sign off. Sure. Pat Hingle didn't give you issues about Commissioner Gordon. That's no, no. And I actually <laughs> capture, I captured him really well if I, if I did say I'm a big, I was talking to Brewster's Millions, Pat Hingle and Brewster's <laughs> Millions. No, I'm a, I love him. He, they didn't use him enough, and they really could have because he's a great yeah. actor. And he's just oh, really, yeah. you know, kind of blustering around on a poor man's Chief O'Hara kind of. Right, right. And it's like, oh, that's a shame, man. You really got to. You got a great actor there. Damn. Well, man. he was. In, I mean, he was in like multiple ones uh, beyond the Keaton. Right. I know he was still playing Commissioner Gordon in the uh, the later ones. So it was, they they definitely had a chance to give him more, you know, more to do. That's hilarious. But uh, but so so the these things went for approval, and then meanwhile, I was still working on the Superman books. I was I was writing right. and drawing at that time. <laughs> So Jesus. it was, you know, like trying to figure out a way to get a vacation from that so I could draw 64 pages. And that wasn't an easy uh, an easy thing to get because, the, you know, Mike Carlin didn't really want to use fill-ins. It was, you know, not a good thing. Yeah. So uh, well, this is, I and, wound up and, doing and double duty. Jay, this, is, this is like the height of your career, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, yeah. in terms of, yeah. yeah, man. So, no, absolutely. It's like. Yeah, don't mess, don't mess with the secret recipe for Superman. Everything's yeah. going good right now. Yeah. So what? What I, I was I was working on that stuff, and I was um, waiting on these approvals. And we got approved by Keaton. We got approved by Kim Basinger's representatives, and then I get the Nicholson one back, and it's the. Uh, <laughs> it was just funny. Both of them, they were done. You know, they DC had photostat them, so the photostat has yellow highlight marker on areas where he didn't think it and it says this does not look like me Ooh. and I'm, i said to jonathan i said well the agent's not going to say that because it's not supposed to look like the agent right, so right, clearly right. nicholson wow. had, had done this wow so i still have i mean it's not like he signed it no but, but still okay. that's yeah it was kind of fun so so but then again at that point i didn't have a lot of joker reference so i didn't have a lot of jack napier stuff that it was really pretty early in the process so all I had to work with was, I think they had a photo spread in Time Magazine or something um, in maybe December or something when that trailer, first trailer had come out. So that was what I had to work with. So, you know, by the time I'd been rejected and had to go back and fix a couple of the Joker and, and Jack Napier things, I, you know, was starting to get some reference. So I at least had um, had a better basis for doing it. And then we, we, we got approved and then we didn't have to look back on it. So. It was kind of a more streamlined process to do it that way. It was, it was definitely the way to go. And I, I don't think they even – see, now I would bet that there probably are clauses in most of the superhero actors, you know, their contracts to allow, you know, that use of uh, likenesses because they're all being digitally scanned and everything. There's got to be, you know, more of that. But I think the issue is more of a – uh, from the comic companies that the comic companies don't have as much access as they used to. You sure. know what I mean? I think as well, much yeah. as it's probably got closer as far as the company, Disney, Marvel, DC, Warner, the film companies are much more secretive. Yes. You know? Well, absolutely. No, you're right. The entire production process. My buddy Rob Burnett, who has a, a YouTube show, um, he got access to the Dune script that's in production and Warner made him yank it down, and there was nothing negative said about it. He is, like, really excited for it, and I, I never saw the video, so I have no idea. But, yeah, Warner got it knocked down on YouTube, and the only complaint was, well, he's commenting on it. And it's like, yeah. okay. <clears throat> and, again, like you said, no, every, everybody's very secret. And also, you know, someone ought to do a history of that era of movie adaptations in the comics, because there's a lot of interesting creators on there, and, I mean, mm -hmm. you know... God, as you know, I mean, right? Walt, Walt, Walt did uh, Walt Simonson. He didn't he do Aliens? Yeah, Walt and Archie Goodwin did Aliens yes. for yeah. through Heavy Metal through through the yes, um, those guys and that. That's right. And then Starenko did Outland. Yes, Jesus. And and um, I'm trying to remember <laughs> the, you had uh, Al Williamson doing the Star Wars. Uh, I think he did The Empire Strikes Back and uh, Return and, of the Jedi. And, and then, he did the uh, De Laurentiis Flash Gordon 
yeah, that yeah. is a ton better. <laughs> Oh yeah, and again, isn't it funny, Jerry? I, I don't know how you feel about the movie, but it seems like when I saw it, I was disappointed. But people younger than us, you know, they were kids, and so they, yeah. of course, they love it. They love that. Well, they're they're looking at it. I mean, I guess they can. You can also come into it with less expectation of it being close to anything because they never read a Flash Gordon comic. True, you or know what I mean. Probably like, didn't see the Buster Crab stuff and everything. Right, yeah, yeah. right. So I mean, I think that that frees you up to accept it being campy or or, or crazy or whatever. And, and it, if you watch it from that perspective, it's 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 kind of it's definitely kind of fun. Yeah, you know, about, I don't know if you've seen it recently, but it's uh, it is fun. I agree with you. No, no, no. It's it is. fun. Well, exactly. It's very. You got to take it that way. Absolutely, yeah. man. And Sam is but, such a good guy. And I mean, oh yeah. I mean, and also uh, Timothy Dalton. Good. I mean, that's that's the great. That's probably the first time I ever was aware of of Timothy Dalton's work. Yeah. And I mean, everything that progressed. I always say he's so vastly underrated, yeah. and especially as he matured, like the character he played in that Looney Tunes back in action. Oh with yeah, Brandon yeah. Frazier, yeah. It's like that's the James Bond Timothy Dalton that I want to yeah. see because yeah. as he got older, it's like. No, that's that's more like that's even more like the books yeah. in my mind's eye. Well, he he was. I don't know if you you watch the show Chuck, but he was on Chuck um, as a reoccurring villain, and he was very very good. But no, uh, I didn't see. I you know I've watched Chuck in and out, and then really once it got uh, streaming, mm-hmm. I really went back and, and watched even more of it, yeah, and yeah. I forgot how much I enjoyed it and everything. So yeah, I'm yeah, it's a, those that's episodes. a fun show. That's great. They had they pulled in a lot of different actors. Who were oh, I know. For, other franchises, I think uh, that was always the, the kind of the fun part about that show too. Is uh, was that like grabbing guys? They were kind of the first ones to do it. I think that you'd grab somebody who was yes. remembered from some James Bond, like with uh, Timothy Dalton, and then making him the evil mastermind or you know a spy or something. But they even used uh, Linda Hamilton. Uh, I think yeah, it's Chuck's mother. Mom. Yeah, he was right, Chuck's right. mom. Well, and even well, and it's Scott Bakula was Chuck's dad, and uh, right, right, and and right. Uh, Chevy Chase played that kind of oh, Steve right, Jobs right. kind of for Bill Gates right. kind of bad guy. Right. Uh, no, it was. I mean, that's the thing. It's like I, I was. I tell a lot of friends. I'm like, you know, if you haven't ever seen Chuck, totally worth seeing. And yeah, yeah. and everybody, God, you know, I mean, and really, it's just a fun, hilarious show. But oh God, Amanda Sante, I know was on there, and. <laughs> Right, yeah, right. I mean that's so it's interesting that I miss the Dalton episodes, but no, I totally agree with you about Chuck. That's <laughs> well, Dalton and, and was Brandon great Ralph. in Penny. Dalton Brandon was Ralph great either. in Penny Penny Dreadful. Say that again. was a, a great part for for Dalton. That was. Uh, uh, do you, did you watch Penny Dreadful? I have not, and I hear nothing but amazing things about it. Yeah, uh, I was to, a, Go ahead. No, I was going to say it's a, it's a a really interesting, fresh take for for all the effort that <clears throat> Universal's tried to put into. Relaunching their, you know, monster franchises and stuff. Penny Dreadful basically did that in that show. There's a Frankenstein. There's a, you know, I mean, they had Dracula. They had all the, <clears throat> all the uh, kind of classics. Um, you know, trying to done. It was just done really well. It was done in a period form. They even had the werewolf. I mean, it was just. Uh, it, it, it's really good. You you watch that. I I guarantee you. You watch the first season. You'll be hooked. You know. Okay. All right. I understand and everything. I was going to say about the the old classic movie specials and stuff. You know, of course, Kirby in two thousand one. Yep, yep. Well, and, they and have, also the series after that. Yep. Well, he spun out right, and he spun uh, Mr. Well, Machine Man was Mr. Machine came out of the two thousand and one. That's right. Yes, um, of course. Can, yeah. Yeah. I just actually was. I went through. I was trying. Somebody had, uh, at my local comic store. I had. Uh, was talking to a guy who was like trying to figure out if they had bags for tap for the treasury editions, and I said they, somebody must have them. So the guy wound up buying them, but he had to buy like a hundred. Oh. And I said, hey, I'll I'll split it with you. Oh, I'll buy geez. some of those. So so I was going through all my treasury editions, and I was kind of you know as I was putting them in these bags, I was going, oh, well, so I sat down, of course. Like you know, like you're suddenly ten years old again. I'm sitting yes. on the floor reading the 2001, and then I'm going, oh, look, here's the Wizard of Oz. Uh, Treasuries that Marvel did with uh, John B. Sema, I think Roy Thomas had adapted them or whatever. There was, a, you know, the Joe Kubert, the Bible. There was just a bunch yep. of wow, you know, yes, <clears throat> Jesus. And I was surprised at what at how many I had. I was like, whoa. Well, I'm impressed, yeah, man, because I have a I have a handful, 
and you know buy, buying them back over the years. And a lot of them are just reader copy quality. Yeah. Yeah. But I love them. I mean, yeah, they were great. And I remember the very first one I got, my father bought for me on our summer vacation, and it was that white covered Shazam collection, Captain oh, Marvel. Yeah. And I and I had never heard of Captain Marvel. And and but it's like, oh, Captain Marvel. I used to read that when I was a kid. You should <laughs> check this out. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and it was like, wow, this is amazing. So well, and again, I was like ten, so I had, I was the perfect age to read the old Captain Marvel stuff. And, and that was, you know, that was a well for me. I think it had to be early seventies when Marvel started expanding. You know, there there were basically, I guess, everybody was trying to eat up space on the newsstand. So they sure. Marvel expanded, then DC expanded. DC did every all their books went to twenty five cents, and they reprinted all this nineteen forty stuff. For the first time, there was a ton of stuff that that I'd never seen. You know, that to me is I was thinking about how influential it was because, for example, I was a big Marvel fan, but in the back of all the Kirby books, the twenty five cent Kirby books, they're reprinting like the Boy Commandos and they're reprinting Newsboy Legion and, oh, and the, wow. all the Kirby stuff from the from the forties, Simon and Kirby from the forties. Yeah, that I didn't even really have a sense of of because I was such a Marvel maniac. So that was like a good, you know, uh, for me, that was almost like training for a couple of years later when I was doing All-Star Squadron, because I I then at least had a familiarity with that era and with, uh, you know, the characters like Shining Knight. And uh, it's like, oh, my God, Shining Knight. There was a, you know, Frank Frazetta drew some like a handful of Shining Knight stories. But then you had really good, you know, more Maskin drawing the vigilante and, and... Wildcat, and you know, there's all yes. these, you know, just really great little pockets. Joe Kubert and Hawkman, of course, even though he was a young kid, they were they had a lot of energy to them. <laughs> Absolutely, so it, it was like for a guy who was too young for that. I mean, I, you know, in the seventies, I was, you know, I was born in 1957, so I really my comic book knowledge really started from say 67 on, mm-hmm. you know, as far as that. So I missed all this other stuff, but I was able to read it because you'd buy a regular copy of. You know, Batman. Well, there was reprints from the fifties in the back of that. That was just a great era. You know, no. I'm, Again, it's was... kind of like when it's like when you talk to kids. Like my kids growing up, would they never really had an appreciation for anything old because sure. everything new was at their fingertips. Exactly. And I, I, I would tell them, I say, like when I was a kid. You know, again, it's not like I had to walk through snow, you know, 10 feet deep or whatever. But it's like when when we were kids, there wasn't a million channels. There was no right. dedicated kids channel. Right. All all you had was UHF channels, which showed old movies. Right. And if there was less on and you wanted to watch something, well, then you'd have to go, oh, I'll see what this is about. And, you know, I was then exposed to tons of great old films, which some of which I haven't seen in 40 years, you know, because they're either lost or they were on a, you know, TV station's uh, 16 millimeter right. or something, you know. <laughs> I know exactly but that what was, you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it was, it was like, yeah, I wouldn't have chose, chosen this purpose, you know, purposely, but because of the limitations of what else was available, <laughs> you know, right. I was exposed to something that was great that, that, you know, kind of fostered a lifelong interest in old movies and, uh, um, but again, now you know there's a cha- there's a channel dedicated to everybody. You know, right? Well, yeah, the, yeah. Now there's Turner, and and that, and I always laugh at that too because you're right. I I saw those same black and white movies. I'm I'm seven years younger than you, you know, and I, you know, so born in '64, and and my stuff was you know really the early '70s is my yeah. most you know vivid aware aware youngest time. And yeah, it was the same way, man. No, it was uh, and and I like you said. I wouldn't have watched the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes movies, but right. it was the only thing on it. And it's like, oh my god, these are great. And and well, and I mean, that's a good example. But like you said, even even the lower UHF channels, good yeah. lord, like the Bowery Boys might be the best oh, movie yeah. they show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that day. Well, the, you, you know, you didn't, you had a, an appreciation for that, just like you know, you could you could certainly. I would always put the Three Three Stooges above them, sure. but but they were well, entertaining. Yeah. Um, you, you had like in, I was in Milwaukee, so up until the time that we got cable, and I think I was I was already working it, you know, for DC probably like 1980 is when we got our first head cable in, in our okay. in our area. 82 for us, but go on. Yeah. So w- once that happened, and I was working at home, hey, I was consuming a lot of TV, and you know, <laughs> I suddenly said like, hey, here's WGN in Chicago. 
well, WGN had those old movies on late at night, and Turner, you know, Turner had his uh, uh, TBS, and they, were, they they ran old movies. And, oh yeah, uh, John Wayne would, York, would be on TBS. Yeah. Absolutely, New York had WPIX, and yeah. you know, I mean, there, it was just those, you know, the old uh, strong broadcast stations that would never reach, say, Milwaukee. <laughs> Right, you know, but we had we had three. Like I said, we had three UHF, pretty much two or three UHF channels, and uh, Channel 18 in Milwaukee ran all the old movies. I got to see tons of stuff that it, you know, affected me uh, deeply. Scared the hell out of me as a kid, <laughs> like the original Mummy, sure. uh, Island of Lost Souls, which was the Doctor Moreau like, story. Yeah, it that's a lot of amazing, creepiest movie, and you know that thing has only gotten creepier as. Every couple of years, somebody finds more footage that had been cut from the original release. Right, yes. And it's like, oh, my God, this thing and was freaks. worse than I... <laughs> I'm sure when you saw Freaks for the first time, how jarring yeah, that yeah. was. You know? I remember that it was a devil doll or something. There was one that uh, I think was a Lionel Barrymore where he shrank people down. <clears throat> oh, you know, I've never seen that one. I'm aware of that one. When you said devil yeah. doll, I was thinking of, uh, wasn't it in the 70s, one of the uh, oh, yeah. anthologies? Yeah, yeah. Black and everything? Yeah, and then they did a story kind of like that. I think they did a couple of those on the Twilight Zones too. But well, uh, that's true. And of course, yeah. one of my favorites with Telly Savalas with hair with some hair, <laughs> talking <laughs> Tina. Of course, oh yeah, the, yeah. The little the little uh, infant uh, doll that is you know classic right. kid toy and stuff. And my name, right, right. And I believe it was June Foray. Yeah, that's that was Tina. a <laughs> that was a creepy one. See, I watched those. I mean, I remember my my brother Joel was like a year, two years older than me. But he and I would watch the Twilight Zones on Friday night. Sure. And my my mom had a tavern, and she her bar closed at eight, so she was open from you know she had like the, uh, it was really like the Bibbo's bar. I mean, she was open from I think seven <laughs> seven thirty yes, in the morning. Yes, you talked about this. That's awesome. Go on. Yes. Yeah, she was like she seven was open in the morning. From, like seven thirty in the morning till like eight at night, <laughs> and it was mostly old retirees. And people who worked in the neighborhood, like machine shop or whatever, that right. people come in shift, after work. Third shift people, exactly. Like they're done at six in the morning, so they need somewhere to go. So we generally had to wait <laughs> till a- after she closed to eat dinner. So eight o'clock, you know. So generally, anything on TV, you know, seven o'clock to eight o'clock. Hey, we were watching it. Um, and then you know later we would. Uh, I think we got to stay up till nine or something. I just remember that being a big thing. And there were like a couple shows that she would kind of, I remember letting me watch with her was when she, one was the fugitive, which she, she really liked oh, David great. Jansen. And, of course. And then I remember watching the F or yeah. Ephraim FBI Mandelis in the FBI. Absolutely, yeah. man. Sunday nights. I remember that. That's hilarious. And my aunt was a big fan of Perry Mason. Yes. And yes. I used to, as a little kid, watch that. And it felt like the uh, the guy who was the defense attorney, is Hamilton Berger or, Berger or, or something, yeah. Yeah, 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 and he he just like the actor himself projected such a creepy quality that I always thought <laughs> that he was the bad guy, like he was really evil or something. Sure, because I was really little. Yeah, well, he was kind of the <laughs> adversary, obviously. Well, he was the, the adversary, but he was. It's just funny think about it when you grow up and you go, wait, oh, he was defending, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, he was the <laughs> prosecutor, and Perry Mason was defending murderers. They're like, wait, who is the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> Dana Gould, the comedian, uh, I know recently was on a serious Perry Mason jack. And the great thing, and, and all the procedurals are great this way, um, you see so many actors when they're babies. Oh, yeah. And these are their first uh, things. Last weekend, uh, the Decades digital channel ran all weekend long the first two seasons of Love American Style. So it's 1970 oh, oh. and 71. And it's so funny because literally Saturday night I see an episode and then Sunday I'm watching the Oscars and Diane Keaton was on an episode. Oh, that's funny. And and literally could not even recognize her and it's still like three years before she did Sleeper, I want to say, with Woody Allen. Right. And she looks very fresh-faced and obviously shot differently for TV than the right. movies. Because, yeah, I mean, outside of her voice, did not recognize her. And then Sunday night, you see her on the Oscars with Keanu, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God. Well, think and again, how I many... love Diane Keaton. I, uh, decades later, I still love yeah. Diane Keaton. She's amazing. But, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I love... But, like, yeah, Penny, uh, Perry Mason, oh, God, you know, tons of... I mean, Commissioner Gordon's, I, I know, on an episode of Perry yeah. Mason. Well, you know, but the like thing that's funny is, in those old shows, it was like you had you had different character actors who worked for different 
studios. So they would yes. show up in all that studio shows. Like Universal had, you know, you'd see the same familiar faces in, you know, supporting roles in all of the Universal shows. Yep. You would say to see the same guys in the, uh, uh shows. like ABC or, or, or yep. you know, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the studio that would, Screen Gems, I think was the, a, a lot of ABC shows. But, you know, that was kind of a cool thing because totally. you would be, if you watched, you know, I mean, Universal made all the dopey, not dopey, but like they did Columbo, they did, you know, uh, Rockford oh, yeah. Files and all this. So there would be those same actors like churning through, through all these shows. No, you're right. It's kind of the last vestiges of the old uh, studio movie system. studio system. Yeah, yeah. But definitely. yeah, well, and a great universal example of that is the guy from The Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic Woman, Richard Anderson. Oh, yeah. Oscar Goldman. And, yep. oh, my God. And I got to meet him at San Diego uh, before he passed away, and he was so cool. And I and I man, I wish I had interviewed him then because and I just talked to him at his at the booth he was signing at. Yeah. But you know, oh, I remember me and Cary Grant making a movie back in '54, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, of course you do. And yeah, he worked with everybody. And like you said, good lord, in the '60s, and especially like on the Fugitive, yeah. he was the Fugitive's uh, brother-in-law. Oh yeah, well yeah, he and, was he was Charlton Heston's. Uh, I think what did he he married into the. I want to say oh, wow. that he married his – somehow he was so involved somehow, like either a sister or a, or a daughter or something. Not a daughter, maybe. I don't know. He was he was in that in that grouping, too, you know, and, and I think sure. you realize that there's connections that, like you're saying, when you see movies from the 50s and you go, oh, look, I recognize there's Robert Wagner or there's oh, – it's yeah. just funny how – that's how – like it used to be with comics – in comic books is that you would have the same faces. Like there's probably the same casting directors working for universal for all those shows. It wasn't like they were churning new casting directors every couple of years. So these people had long time histories with people. They could immediately go, you know, that's that guy. Here's the script. Oh, you need this guy, this type of guy. Here's, you know, Joe blow Yep. in comics. It used to be like that when you had people who were there for long periods of time, they knew everybody, they could assess your, like, oh, we need somebody to fill in on Superman. Oh, grab him because he did this or he's, you know, he, he can do the deadline in two weeks or whatever. You know, I don't know that that exists in any historical fashion nowadays, you know. As far as comics go. Yeah, I don't know. But, that's why, but that's why I think even with the actors, a lot of those people probably had long, memorable, maybe they weren't making millions of dollars, but they were making you know, good, probably upper middle class money throughout yeah. that whole period because they were working every week, you know? Yes, absolutely. Well, and even maybe, you know, two or three shows the same week where, you know, yeah, I'm doing Emergency on Tuesday and I'm doing Adam 12 on uh, Thursday and whatever. I mean, right, all those right. shows. Yeah, and like, right. you know, and I really want to read a good history of specifically Universal from that period as well. Yeah. Because, yeah, they were like the last ones. And also... They had tons of wardrobe. They had tons of stock footage. Yep. So you could really construct a show, you know, with because again they they still had all their their movie legacy. Yep. And yeah, we're just shitting out television shows. Well, I was the thinking 50s. about you know I was thinking you know, about the you know the the aspect of having the giant prop departments, the giant war, yes. you know, wardrobe departments. How valuable that was. I mean, it it probably lent a little, you know, generic quality to a degree, but. What a great, uh, you know, amount of support for whatever you wanted to do. If they wanted to do a costume drama, hey, we've got costumes from whatever movie that we spent a lot of money on in the fifties. <laughs> you know, you you got your king, you got your queen, you got your you know guys in armor. They could do that on, you know, like we watch. You probably watch too, like the dopey shows, like the Time Tunnel or whatever. Of course, any kind of time travel. Like suddenly, hey, one week they need. You know, cavemen. The next, you know, the next week they need cowboys, and the next week yep. they need, you know, knights in armor or something. That was all at their beck and call. Plus, they, like you said, they could also rely on stock footage. Um, well, and also, yeah, they would use, like you said, um, you know, like the like I believe Time Tunnel was all 20th Century Fox. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. Like they had decades of props and and costumes and and everything. There was. Did you see this documentary? Just a couple of years ago, and Gabe Hardman, the artist, is in it as as one of the talking heads. Mm-hmm. It was about this couple, and they were storyboard artists and other, you know, very important jobs in in Hollywood and everything. Mm-hmm. But you know, uh, 
uh, support people, production people. And the wife went to work on um, the Fox lot and was in, I want to say, like the art department or the photo reference department and stuff. Uh-huh. And they were going to, like, get rid of it. Oh, yeah. and, and thank God they went to the Motion Picture Association and they're like, we'll take it over. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, thank God, because literally they had production notes going back to, like, you know, um, you know, although I think he was at Warner Brothers, but, you know, think of like the Edward G. Robinson yeah. era making a gangster movie and yeah, making yeah. it authentic and stuff like that. Well, there, I mean, there was just, know. I just saw, I don't know if this related to that, but I just saw a story about. I don't remember where, on somewhere online I looked it up. But it was about the beginnings of Fox Studios, and they were in the article itself. They were talking about how a lot of this history was almost lost, and maybe that's the same thing you're talking about because it, it related to the original the, the the guy who originally started Fox, who was you know a, apparently pretty progressive and forward thinking for the 1920s, but that he got kind of forced out in the 30s at some point by, I guess, uh, taking on a partner. And then the partner forced him out, and it became 20th Century Fox or whatever. Right. But he said all this history was in boxes that were, that were about to be destroyed. So maybe that just happens a lot because it's all paper. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. somebody else's history. But it does seem like a, a, an archive that should exist somewhere. You know, well, of that course. should have. Yeah. No, I'm with but, you. Oh, you know, and uh, turning it back to comics. That's why I always point to Amazing Heroes, of course, the Comics Journal, uh, David Anthony Kraft's Comics Interviews uh, mm-hmm. magazine, um, all that stuff. I'm sure you read it as well. well I, you were already a pro. Were you reading it when, it, when you were a pro? Were you reading yeah. those magazines? Yeah. I think I bought uh, Amazing Heroes every, whatever, it was monthly or something. Yeah. Yeah, it was I monthly. I remember that. Yeah. And I but bought that, the, uh, the Comics Journal Generally, if they were interviewing somebody I was interested in, because they did the big long form interviews, right? And that's what I was going to say. Like um, the, uh, you know, now obviously, to, you know, really probably starting in the late nineties and and on, every moment is recorded, so it's yeah. easy. But really, I always say the twentieth century is this last period where there are some little gaps here and there, and especially even in the comic business. And it's like, let's hang on to that stuff because. You know, they were the ones that that talked to Hal Foster before he died about yeah. Prince Valiant and yeah. some of the, some of the great comic book history. Because also, and it drives me crazy um, when I hear uh, a, a podcast, and hey, I do it too, where we make mistakes and stuff, yeah. and then, you know, get something wrong. But even sometimes when it goes a step further, and and there's just this like mythology that the podcaster seems to have about things. And like right. I remember hearing a, a podcast. And they're like, yeah, you know, Bill Everett, it was such a shame. He only did that one issue of Daredevil, and that was it. And it's like, uh, no, there was another 10 years of his career. And, of course, you know, like seeing that the Daredevil issue was the last thing he did. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Eh, no. Yeah, no, <laughs> no and, and Everett, he kept going. I mean, that's, those are, it's it, interesting to think about this. Because I, I think of Everett a lot because he did, you know, he created Submariner, which is yep. an iconic early comic book creation still still around still yep. you know <clears throat> very important to the marvel continuity and stuff marvel seemed to and I, there was a really good in- issue of uh, alter ego that was devoted to him a couple of years ago and it was kind of interesting because as i was reading this you got the impression that because he came from a wealthy family he came from a well-to-do family Go and he had yes and he was he was clearly an alcoholic Yes. And he'd have times where he was totally unreliable, fall off the map. But you know what? The companies always gave him work. And yes. he got to do Submariner work in the 70s, 60s, 70s, um, even into whatever the, towards the end. I mean, he still got that work. Yes. And the, the, the funny thing is in this interview or with uh, in Alter Ego, it indicated that maybe he got a little bit of a preferential treatment not so much that he created submariner but he came from a a good family like a well-known like that had that status or whatever had some impact on it so i'm reading that article and i'm thinking to myself okay you have other people who have had really kind of horrible ends who also succumb to alcohol um and just basically you know died kind of in obscurity or working as night guards or some menial job that doesn't befit their talents. You know, Reed Crandall was one that comes to mind. I think uh, there's 
plenty of guys like that, uh, plenty of people like that in the comics yeah. industry. And it was just interesting that that jumped out at me was like that Bill Everett, you know, hey, you you could create a superhero that was impact, you know, high impact and everything, but how much are companies going to keep remembering that? Well, Marvel did well by him. You know what I mean? Maybe he didn't make Agreed. millions, Agreed. but every time he came out, somebody gave him another project, which was cool. And he, he contributed. He did beautiful work up until the end. Yes. But how much of that is, like, Wally Wood? Did Wally Wood get that? No, Wally no, Wood was just unreliable, not. and he was an alcoholic. It's kind of a shame, because yes. it really wasn't necessarily about the talent. It was the fact that, you know, maybe that class kind of aspect was in play. Same thing was true, I think, when you read about, like, any Stan Lee comments were, were always funny about George Tuska. Now, George Tuska had a great career, many highs and, you know, not a lot of lows. He seemed to be steadily employed up until he retired. But Stan Lee was impressed because this guy was a good-looking guy and he was, like, really tall. You know, it was just, it's interesting how some of that stuff, obviously he still had to do good work and he still had to make deadlines and all this. And he did. But it's just funny how certain aspects... You know, maybe the these guys would project onto somebody. You know what I mean? Like maybe sure. Stan respected the fact that this guy was, you know, a, a strapping, you know, <laughs> handsome, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and Will Everett was from a, a storied New York family or Massachusetts family or whatever it was. You know, there's a certain other aspect that some, somehow comes to play, which I guess we all do. You know? Yeah, man, I, mean, I think so. I think that happens in life. I mean, no, the good, the good-looking people, they they get prefer. There's that subconscious <laughs> thing. I, I, yeah. I don't even think it's even intentional. It's just again, this is in the yeah. back of our minds. We've been programmed this way. Yeah, well, it's the uh, <laughs> like. I think they do, they just play with it really well in The Simpsons, one of my favorite shows. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Simpsons, but it's the you know, uh, Mr. Burns was, who is that dynamic young go-getter? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you know, one episode it's Homer, the next episode is who is this guy? <laughs> you know? Right, oh yeah, Cincinnati. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <clears throat> but I always like the, the concept of the dynamic, you know, go-getter. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we do, I mean, we, we, but we certainly project that type of thing into even actors that we like or we don't oh, God, like yes. or whatever, you know? Sure. So, I mean, when you see movie casting or you see something, you think, well, oh, I don't see that person at all because, I mean, again, that looping it back to Michael Keaton, there was a huge furor at the time over yes. Keaton as Batman because yes. Keaton had basically just been Beetlejuice or he'd been, Mr. you know, uh, right, right. So, you know, you know he's you, a wacky comedian, he night shift and Mr. Mom and no, right. it's just why you have ass, to, why is you have to show them. That? You know, you have to show them a, a role that that breaks that, and that's probably hard for an actor once they get into that little typecast, that little box. But uh, Keaton had done Clean and Sober, and that right. came out before Batman. And that was clearly like a more dramatic role. It was like, oh, yeah. okay, this guy's got chops, yeah. you know? No, you're um, right about that. Well, and also, and I, and I know this comparison's made been made before, comparing today's social media outrage over casting or whatever. And, you know, all we had back then were the letter pages of right. Alter Ego right. and Amazing Heroes and all the, all the old, all the old magazines and right, stuff. Right. And yeah. And no, I remember reading that stuff. And also the dream casting of, oh man, if they ever did Dark Knight as, Dark Knight Returns as a movie, they got to get Clint Eastwood. And he right. would be perfect at 60. He would have been perfect right. at 60 year old Batman. Right. Right. So, you know, no, it's, uh, I love, uh, yeah, I, I I remember that, and of course, yeah, like you said, it's um, no, it does. It takes the you got it. Sometimes you have to trust the uh, the the casting guys. Yeah. Well, who would have thought um, Chris Pratt would be? A, first of all, who would have thought about a Star Lord movie? Right, anyway? right, right. And then Chris Pratt being a great action hero. Right. I mean, and you know, all we knew him from was Parks and Rec and um, right five five year Roman a five year engagement and everything. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's no, funny it's, though too because you you in a case like that, it is clearly it clearly starts with the script. I mean, as much as the actor brings to it, somebody, the casting person, they, the director, whatever, they all had they had a script, and the script had to have been written in a way that indicated this character is not your conventional, you know, sure, uh, perfect superhero guy, 
You know, so I think that's where you start looking at, hey, this guy was good in comedy. Uh, he's got kind of a light touch. You know, he'd be great in this. So you, you wind up then tailoring maybe t- after he's cast, you tailor some stuff directly to his irreverence or what have you, and yeah. then you've got something, you know. But, uh, but yeah, if, if it was a more noteworthy role, then people would have had more time to, you know, be up in yeah, arms nice. over it, no doubt. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like but, I like Paul Rudd as Scott Lang. Oh and yeah, it's funny because I mean I I remember that initial Marvel premiere where Scott Lang debuted be, debuted because I I've always loved Ant Man's original uh, comic book uniform. Yeah, and yeah. it was this great shot of you know the classic uniform and uh, you know some giant man obviously. And I was like, oh, this is great. But yeah, the last thing in the world, I mean, I thought of was Paul Rudd. Obviously, yeah. even like down to the hair color. I think his hair was like right. red or orange or whatever you yeah, know, yeah. in the comics. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it was fun. You know, yeah, it's like, oh, no, he's he's great. He's perfect. So, and again, I leaning into his strengths and enough of a blank slate that people can accept it. What do you think of uh, Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange? I like him. I, I, I don't know if you heard <laughs> the original guy that they were after. No. Uh, was Joaquin Phoenix at the time when that was first being cast? He was weird. He was kind of yeah. I, yeah, I don't Which, think so. <laughs> I could. I, I think it would have been a different thing. Oh yeah. You know? Oh but, yeah. Uh, but I was thinking about you know. I mean, this week pretty historic that Joaquin Phoenix wins an Oscar for <laughs> the Joker. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, a little bit mind-boggling but i think well deserved it was really a, i mean if oh, it's you a saw the movie it's yeah. a great performance and it's you know clearly uh someone having to basically starve themselves down to skin and bones is a <laughs> something that most people can relate to like, no, no uh-huh. i'm with you on that and he and he acted the hell out of it but i'll be honest here i i uh and i and i was pretty candid about this when the movie came out I think I've read too many Batman Joker stories, and I, yeah. I I couldn't help but be influenced by that. So that was on the comic book side of the movie that I yeah. felt like there was too much Batman mythos in there. But also, yeah. um, again, us being old movie buffs, I keep saying, and and don't disrespect men to Todd Phillips, because right. for a guy to make a movie like that and the Hangover movies and yeah. the G.G. Allen documentary – yeah. Uh, about gross G. G. Allen from the 80s and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's a hell of a filmmaker. That yeah. said, it really rang the Scorsese bell so hard yeah. that I'm like, this is like seeing a great cover band do yeah. an amazing version of a song and a good portion of the audience having no idea what the original even sounded like. Right, right. Yeah, no, I I, I, I totally get that. I, I, I don't think that was... It didn't. That didn't bother me. You know. I mean, it was. It. I think the fact that it was an alternate take was fine. I sure. think I would have had a harder time, uh, maybe having it be more integrated into the DC continuity, so to speak. You, you would know, have I wanted think, it to be more. No, I think I would have. I liked it better as an isolated thing. Because I agree. It is an else world. You know. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, but what what I liked. What I liked about it, and again, you know, Mitch and I, Mitch Halleck and I, yes. uh, had gone to see the the thing. I think we got that somehow. Somehow he got us in on a Wednesday night for some oh, some nice. reason. <laughs> but uh, he, it was just funny at the at the at the very end of that. He looked at me and he goes, "Well, it was well made, but man, I don't think I ever want to see that again." And I was like, "I don't know." And we had this long discussion about whether it had any appeal to young kids. You know, and I said, sure. I don't, I actually think it's hitting the right political vibe. Yes. Um, and, and I, you know, before that movie came out, there were all kinds of stories about, oh, it's from the time it started getting previewed, I think people were, I don't know who, but there were media stories about how this could be a dangerous film. And, right. you know, and, and you know what, when you see it, it makes you realize that dangerous through the media meaning not necessarily individuals, but maybe the media companies, is changing or shaking the status quo. And the status quo is the status quo for a reason. It's protected, no major changes. That movie pretty much, at the by the end of it, is asking for rioting. And, and, yeah, revolution. You know, and that's, that's something that is uncomfortable, maybe if you're 
a company that owns Starbucks or your, you know what I mean? It, it, yes. It's uncomfortable. But I grew up in the 60s. I mean, right. I was a kid in the 60s, right. and there was a lot of social upheaval, and I can't look back on that social upheaval and say that was wrong. I think that was absolutely right, and it was right for the time because of, of how the 50s had led into the 60s. Agreed. It made us question things. And absolutely. I think, so it's, it's, it's totally in the, in the moment, and that's why I think there was an appeal to young people. And maybe they, you know, maybe they just thought it was cool to see somebody because you know, it was it was pretty violent. Yes. But it wasn't. In, it, that, that was the other thing that Mitch and I talked about was that the violence was contained and it was more minimal up until the end. But when right. it happened, it was really shocking. It was like you just went whoa, as opposed mm-hmm. to a movie where a guy's spraying a machine gun and killing eighty five you know, commandos or whatever, where you don't know any of those commandos, you don't have any, there's no empathy for that. You know what I mean? It's like a, uh, it, it kind of, that like is totally game. desensitizing yourself to the violence. Right. So it was very effective in that way. And that just, that actually impressed me. You know I mean? The first gunshot was like, whoa. And that's how it should be in a way. You know I mean? I Agreed. think it was, it was the antidote, at least within that little film, to, you know, this uh, a whole genre, which is about, again, maybe that springs out of video games or whatever, or, it, you know, is a reaction to 20 years of, of uh, people fighting in Afghanistan or something, you know what I mean? There's definitely a militari- militarization feeling in video games and, you know, adults, actually more adult video games, all gun stuff. Sure. It's a weird thing because it does desensitize you. You know, I don't think it would this and the, the point of the Joker is it doesn't it's not gonna desensitize you if you see it happening in front of you. You know what I mean? And we generally don't get to see somebody get shot in front of us. So uh, I think that was kind of a to me that was my takeaway was like, well, this is actually very powerful to remind you that yeah, this is bad bad news. <laughs> you know, you if you got shot, if you're on the street and the car drives by and somebody's going for somebody else and you take a couple of bullets, it doesn't matter if you got a couple of bullets in you and maybe you don't die from it, that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. You know, yeah. that's what violence yeah. is about. Um, and I think we do, we're at a point where we really have kind of desensitized because there's school shootings and there's all these other things that are pretty horrific <clears throat> and we don't know how to stop them, or we at least, you know, people will say they don't know how to stop it. You know, and it, it, it seems to be more of an education issue, you know. I mean, you can argue all the other political points, but to me it feels like people really have, not be generalizing, but a lot of people have kind of lost that sense of shock over, over stuff like that because they feel inundated. There's always some bad news, and, you know, the world is a smaller place because the media is showing you stuff happening everywhere. But... Uh, you know, it's well, really almost like a construct of the media because the media sells more to get more clicks or whatever it is with bad news than they are going to sure. get with good news. Sure. So, you know, that, well, and that can overwhelm you. I mean, I, could, I totally sympathize with people who feel that uh, overwhelming depression from the state of things. But, <laughs> you know, when we were, not even when we were kids, but 15, 20 years ago, you'd really feel empathy because, you know, New Orleans is flooded or whatever. Right. And you would, you would feel it. Now it's like, oh, you know, 25 inches of water in uh, Houston or Louisiana or something, and you go, it's just another news day. So or, it, or the ravaging of Puerto Rico. Yeah. And, I mean, it, you, you know, just, and it's like, yeah, all right, fine. But, you know, that was last month's news. Right now we're really yeah. focused on the impeachment. Leave us alone. Yeah. I no, mean, I, 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 that's what I think is the disposable presentation yeah. of i mean god you know uh, flint michigan's water crisis oh, yeah. is still absolutely happening and when's the last time you heard about it yeah you know well, i mean just and- stuff like that and i it's just no it's i i agree with that now and it's interesting though because i would say and and joker impact i i came out of that like you and mitch and felt a bit like Mitch, and I think Mitch and i even had this conversation well, i'm like I, I don't know if i want to see it again either and then yet i realized that movie haunted me for like several weeks afterwards, yeah. and I'm like, I must have subconsciously 
liked it in an art appreciation way more than yeah. I initially gave it credit. Yeah. So okay, yeah. then I had a bunch of conversations on this podcast with various people that have you know worked on the Joker or whatever, and it's like, what did you think? And I'm glad we're talking about this. Yeah. And I would say actually that what you described to me didn't come as much from the Joker movie, but more like the Matrix movies where yeah. you would gun down people and it really was this desensitized moment. Right. I almost think the the politics of Joker is what did elevate it from where we are with other, I mean, even the direct video game adaptations yeah. that are out there, like Max yeah. Payne and some of these other movies that have been in Hitman, right. all these other movies over the years and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, But again, again, I agree with you. Joaquin Phoenix, absolutely, no, absolutely deserving. Isn't it yeah. interesting that the two Oscar-winning uh, comic book performances revolve around the Joker? Yeah, yeah. That's and they were cool. both pretty dynamic. Yeah. Uh, takes on the character which is interesting well you knew you mentioning even the about the uh, king of comedy or the uh taxi driver as far right, as taxi like, driver. Yep, both of leaning those, on or whatever but i, yeah. I always think of dark knight <clears throat> and uh christopher nolan I- admits his his indebtedness to uh uh michael mann movies like he um, oh wow well sure he you know you say the, that absolutely yes so i think i mean i i, I think I know, uh, like Mitch had said, he he watched Taxi Driver, and he was like, holy crap, they did a lot of shot-for-shot stuff. Oh, God. And I know they did, or I assume they did. I have a, Taxi Driver was a movie that I watched. I went to the theater to see when it when it came out, right when it mm-hmm. came out, but after it had you know, gotten some acclaim and all that. And I remember thinking, wow, this is really disturbing. And that was a movie I actually never went back to. Not that I, you know, I mean, I saw it I once. And I, I haven't like, either. You know, I mean, this yeah. is heavy duty. Uh, it was just uncomfortable, you know. But I didn't I, see it till the eighties, and it was at the Chicago Film Festival, <laughs> and they re- or it was at one of our art house theaters, and they were, you know, uh, bringing it back tenth anniversary, something like that. And yeah, it's an incredible film. But no, I felt the same way in terms of yeah, I don't need to see this again. It is so brutal, but yeah. it was incredibly realistic, and the performances yeah. are amazing, and also just even the little things of oh god, there's Albert Brooks. Oh, God, right. there's 13-year-old Jodie Foster. Oh, God, there's Ira Keitel with really long hair. <laughs> well, you know what? Generally speaking, I'm not a big nihilistic movie fan. <laughs> Neither uh, am I. And I was thinking about this because, I mean, it, there's a case like even when you see a, a movie like Raging Bull, which is about a guy who just can't make the right, right. choices. Love that movie. It's Go kind on. of distressing to watch somebody uh, Fall go apart. through their life yeah, yeah. each step making mistakes. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't like uh, everything to have a perfect happy ending, <clears throat> but I like, I, I think some of those type of uh, performances, and in Joker is certainly one of those. <clears throat> it's overwhelmingly uh, uh, kind of sad to watch a character have basically a downward spiral, you know. Sure. And that was the case certainly with the taxi driver as well and and you know the social commentary in some respects in a lot of these movies you can read into and maybe everybody doesn't come away with the exact same uh you know analysis of it but the fact that they make you think about stuff is a plus because a lot of movies i watch sure. stuff on netflix or whatever and the next day it's like what did i watch and it, it wasn't yes. even something that was bad yes it was something but... that was kind of decent but not great Right. And it just immediately flies out of my head, and I think about that. It's like uh, some stuff that you're a little bit disturbed by is stuff that you keep rolling through your head and you keep thinking about. A lot of times it's the same with music. Like I I hear a song and I go, eh, I don't know if I like that. It kind of bothers me. And then eventually it's like, wow, that's my favorite song, you know, Funny. as opposed to something that you hear from once and you immediately love, and then you're tired of by the time you've heard it the fifth time. Yeah, um, bubblegum. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, as soon as the flavor's gone, well, why am I chewing this? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, <I'm, laughs> so, I was hey, going to say about Raging Bull, uh, I actually met LaMotta, uh, and not a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a historic boxer and an, a very interesting career. Not a nice person. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's fine, whatever, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, know what, I know what you mean in terms of watching somebody crumble like that, too. Is not a pleasant thing. And I would I'd have, raise your hand if you're a nihilistic film fan. But I didn't know they're out there. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I mean, again, it, it, a lot of this 
there's a, a certain art house kind of quality to a lot of that in the old days there used to be that you would see a, a yeah a really stark kind of portrait of somebody in a spiral and and uh, and it's not that that's that's certainly valid as a movie it's just not oh, God, valid yeah. as the popcorn gambler. entertainment and that's the problem i think we're in now it, you know maybe that even goes back to what scorsese took heat for as far as complaining about the superhero or the marvel movies is the idea that those movies are getting all the attention it's not that they're you know i mean they're they're sucking up a lot of oxygen in the room but there's still yes. room for interesting stuff it's just that those are getting you know an inordinate amount of attention so they're the popcorn movies and they're no right. different than the james bond movies of the 60s 70s 80s 90s 2000s um those movies are also no different than the old-fashioned hollywood tentpole movie which used to be something like the you know uh the greatest show on earth or the ten commandments or what have you you know each studio would put out a multi-million dollar big production and when we were kids they usually came out around christmas you know right right and that, that they those things attracted an inordinate amount of attention and they generally had all the stars in the world or what have you <clears throat> so that's been going on for a long time uh, but there was more room in the theater and more people were seeking out yeah godfather and and the yeah. weightier stuff and yes there was i mean Irwin allen all of his disaster movies, right, and that's a right. great example of big productions with mul- you know, multiple celebrities. The and, Towering Inferno. Exactly. The Poseidon and, Adventure, right? Absolutely, yes. Those <laughs> kinds of movies. and uh, But there was still room for Coming Home, and yeah. uh, God, even uh, The Turning Point, all about yeah. ballet. Yeah. You know, and the, Bancroft and Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. You know. Right, but the thing is, not everybody saw those, because that wouldn't well, be but, everybody's cup of tea. I think that the, the big... The, the big tentpole movies have a, or at least used to have a wider appeal. It was like if you're going to see right. one movie this year, you know, you see Ben Hur or something. You know, I think that's, again, that's always been with us. The, the thing is, the sure. movie business has changed so that now <clears throat> the movies that we're talking about, even that Martin Scorsese is talking about, it's almost justification for him to be able to do The Irishman on Netflix as opposed to a movie theater. The streaming services have tons of movies in that range. They're low, low to mid-level, and yes. there's tons of them that are great. Like, I, I get the New York Times, I read the Times. On Friday, they usually do movie reviews for stuff playing in New York, and they're smaller movies. I read the reviews, I write down the title of the film, and then I go on Netflix, and I'll find them, you know, and, and get the DVD or whatever, rent the DVD from Netflix. Um, and they're fabulous little movies. The problem sure. is that it's not like going, just the same as comic books, it's not like going to a comic spinner rack where there's a finite number of slots, going to a movie where there's maybe, you know, two or four movies at most in a theater. You know, everything's out at once, so it's harder to find them. And that's, that's you know, a valid thing, whether it's, you know, like the, the Irishman got a lot of promotion from Netflix. We knew it was on Netflix as opposed to a lot of movies that just show up on Netflix or Amazon or wherever right. that get no promo or they get one little notice on the Friday that they start streaming and then that's it. So, yep. I mean, it's it's like, again, like being a comic artist or creator, you can put out your book and if your book isn't, if you're doing it yourself, you're not going to have a big promotional push, but most of the stuff goes to the comic store and then that's it. It sells or it doesn't sell. Right. And a lot of stuff gets forgotten, and a lot of yes. stuff is still good. It's just that, you know, even your own audience, like my audience, what have you been doing lately? Well, I did this, and this actually, you know, like this Captain America thing I did with Roy. Yeah, and last year. The Invaders, Captain America yeah. story. Came yeah, we out talked on, about it last year, absolutely. Right, that thing, uh, it seems like it sold pretty well, but Excellent. I was still having to sell it to people. In other words, like, what have you been doing lately? Well, I did this thing, and I think you guys who liked All-Star Squadron, who liked all this stuff would really like this, and, oh, I never heard of it or something. Did you? So, were, were you able? Did you have it at your table? Like, you were at, I know you're going to be at Terrificon again, and you were there in the summer and stuff mm-hmm. in August, but, like, did you have the cap issue at your table? I had a couple of copies of it just because I, I think I went to Heroes Con before it came out, and I was telling people it was coming out. So by the time Terrificon, I thought, well, I'll, I bought a couple extras. I'll put them out here just in case people didn't know it existed. But, sure. Uh, 
I think it sold go? well. It's just, yeah, yeah, they, they, they sold. But I do think that there's, you know, it's very easy. Again, the nature of comics is that every week there's a new batch. The nature right. of TV or movies is there's always new material. So it's harder to, you know, to keep up. If you miss well, it that and, first week, you're... And, you and your collaboration with Roy, it really wasn't one issue, one shot. It wasn't yeah. a graphic novel. Yeah. Um, it was oversized, right? Um, no, it was, well, it was, oh, no, thir- it was, the page count was 30 pages, so, yeah, I guess maybe it was a, a little longer than the normal comic, but... Oh, okay, but still around, like, 20, 24, something like that? Uh, no, it was, it was like I said, the, ins- the, the art page, there was 30, 30 pages 30 of story. 30 pages of story. 30 so, pa- well, that's, no, that's a, dude, that's a, that's a comic and a half today. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I, and I did... <laughs> I just did, I know to uh, you and me, it's like what? It's a comic. What? <laughs> I, I just finished the Submariner story with um it was for the Marvel Snapshots, which is celebrating oh, yeah. the Marvel's uh uh Kurt Busick, Alex Alex Ross thing. Yes. And um the Submariner story is written by Alan Brennert, who Oh great um, wrote a, just a, a, I I immediately Alan and I had wanted almost worked together maybe ten years ago. On that top ten, um, Alan oh, Moore okay. ABC um, thing. Yeah, for Wildstorm, uh, Alan Moore's uh, <laughs> and then police he, procedural. Uh, he was going to yeah. write the top ten miniseries like that. I wound up drawing with Paul D. Filippo, which Paul did a fantabulous job. But I had um, Paul on the show to talk about it. Absolutely, man. Back that was one of my first, like within my first year of Word Balloon. That's oh, that's hilarious. funny. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so so the Alan couldn't do it because I think he went to work as. Like story editor on that Scott Bakula Star Trek show, so it was like the timing was whatever that he just had gotten the either head writer or something like story editor or something on that show, so he couldn't do it. But uh, oh wow! So this came up again in the summer, and, and Kurt Brisek said, "Hey, uh, I want to put you guys together on this." So it was a it's a retro story set in 1946, right after the war, 45, 46. All and, all winter squad uh, era, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it's a pretty much Submariner centric, but it has the all winners in it, and it uh, it takes place mostly at the uh, Palisades Amusement Park. Ha. So there's like a little extra comic bonus for anybody who's old enough to remember the uh, Superman ads in the DC comics with Superman holding the Palisades Amusement Park and the free coupon or a yes. like, half off coupon or whatever. Yes. <clears throat> Hilarious! So uh, this Columbia. thing comes out in, um, I think it comes out in March. Oh, that's awesome, Jerry! I'm, I'm really glad we're talking now that people and again, can look for it yeah. and, and grab it, man. That's amazing. A 30 page story. So that was the, this seems to be my thing now. So <laughs> and currently, currently working on a thing that Craig Russell is adapting um, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology book. Wow, uh, that's for, terrific! I, for Dark awesome. Horse. So I'm doing, a, I'm doing yeah, again about good, 30 dude. pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Oh, it's going to be thirty pages this well. <laughs> yeah, but over two issues. So, <clears throat> but uh, so it's been fun. I mean, that's yeah. to me. It's it's uh, it's kind of fun because I was a big fan of the of the Norse mythology book, game and um, the audio book he narrated himself. And it, it's just a. Uh, it was kind of interesting to f- hear some of the myths of Thor's hammer and different Loki stories and stuff, but. Uh, he did a nice job narrating it. So when the when the Dark Horse asked me, I was like, "Wow, there's one that I, I, I love that book," and I actually am getting to do like one of the my favorite stories in there. So it's a Loki story mostly, but Loki and the dwarves, and uh, oh, wow. it's been a lot of fun. I'm about halfway through it. So um, and and is it P. Craig Russell or is it a different Craig Russell? Yeah, no, no, P. Craig Russell. He's he it did, is P. Craig Russell. He, Great. Yes, he, wow. He did, so is he think, is he adapting the prose? I mean, you're both artists. Yeah, so what's yeah, going yeah. on? Yeah, Craig, okay. uh, Craig did the American Gods with uh, yeah. Dark Horse, and I think it's just finished up or is just finishing up. I'm not sure oh, if the last great. issue. Oh, already... the American Gods adaptation yeah, yeah. is just finishing up. Go on. So this this is uh, he's doing he's adapting the script, and then he uh, actually kind of kind of a cool throwback, and I guess that's the way he likes to work. But he had the the boards lettered on the board, and uh, the uh, Galen Showman, I think, is the guy who did the lettering. It's really beautiful lettering. It's very r- reminiscent of uh, uh, John Workman um, Funny. lettering. Wow, wow! But it's so Craig did like really rough layouts just to pace out the panels and you know okay. put the 
put the balloons in. So I'm working off of the uh, uh, boards that actually have lettering on, which is kind of fun. Wow, that's really cool. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Is this the first time that you and Greg have worked together? Uh, he inked my Wonder Woman story that I did with Walt Simonson back in early 2000s. We did like an eight-issue I think it was an eight issue or six issue. I forget if it was eight or six, but a Wonder Woman uh, storyline that fell right between Phil Jimenez's run at the end of Phil's run, but before the Greg Rucka relaunch. Oh, so it was about sure. 2004, maybe three, yeah, yeah, yeah. three or four. Oh, which they actually finally, yeah, they finally collected that in uh, 2018, 2017. I think they probably in support of the movie. It. I'm assuming. Yeah, it was it was a cool story because you know I I sought that one out when I'd heard <laughs> Mike Carlin's assistant editor uh, Ivan Cohen at the time. Ivan had said, "Oh, I just inherited the Wonder Woman book, and I and you know what? I got Walt Simonson to write a you know story that fits in be- before we do the re- the relaunch or whatever." And I was like, "Wait, Walt is Walt Simonson's writing a Wonder Woman? I, can, can I draw that?" And it was like, "Huh, I didn't even think of you." And I wound up talking. <laughs> talking myself into it so it was fun awesome. it was yeah yeah it was definitely uh so craig wound up he uh p craig uh, russell inked that and oh uh, wow that's cool sure yeah, and then i think we we met for the first time at i want to say it was baltimore a couple of years ago at the baltimore con okay and uh i had never met him before that point uh we had talked on the phone a couple times but he was you know it was nice and again that's that's you know, great. I don't know how it how it came up with me, but I'm glad because it was it's a fun change of pace from you know the superhero type stuff. So sure, no, Craig's been on the show a couple times over the years, and I always enjoy talking to him. He's he's great. And there's a we mentioned Doctor Strange earlier. I loved his Doctor Strange. It was oh yeah, it was amazing. Well, he so, he's my hero because <laughs> I remember telling him this. I had read this. I don't know if you know much of the history of of. Uh, there's always been like a, a little especially Marvel-style storytelling, there's always been that kind of dispute going on between writers and artists as far as the way a Marvel comic traditionally was done. I don't know that they do it this way anymore, but in the old days, you would get an outline, which was more like it was not structured. You would have to break it down into page breaks. In other words, somebody would just type up, say, a page, and it would have a general story and you would fill it in basically what you're improving with as an artist and would a page, stuff. Yeah. Would a page represent the whole story or a page? No, no, no. The, the page, comic. yeah, the page would represent the whole story. So you'd have to go through Amazing. that and you'd yes, have to the go Marvel, the Marvel one, method. Go two, on. three. So you'd have to figure out how it paced out over 20 wow. pages or 22 pages. Yeah. That's a lot of work, man. <clears throat> so I guess <laughs> Craig had a, had a, uh, his little story, which just cracked me up and I'd read about it years and years ago. When Marvel first started returning artwork, the guy who made that decision, of course, was a writer. And that I, I don't know if it was Roy or if it was one of the other uh, editor in chiefs that sure, there was like a rotating whoever, thing. Yeah, yeah. But the decision was made that the writer would get like two two pages of original art from the, from the book, and he was part of the split. So there wasn't just the inker and the penciler splitting. The writer got like a couple of pages, two or three. And a lot of artists had a problem with that because, sure. like, hey, you didn't actually, you know, the letterer probably has a better claim to, to getting a page sure. than he lettered physically on these. Right. So that was an argument that existed back in the 70s. Well, Craig did a Doctor Strange thing, which was apparently in limbo for a long time. He had plotted it and drawn it, and I think what happened was it whoever was going to write it, Marvel didn't do it and then a couple maybe a period of time later it was revived and i think marv dialogued it and during that time when art was supposed to go some of it was supposed to go to the writer craig was adamant that marv because he came on to it late he just basically dialogued something that was pre-existing there's no way i'm going to have let marv have a page or whatever so the legend <laughs> that i read was just funny because he had finished his pages in pencil and ink, and the the artwork, the all the captions and the word balloons were done on paste up. Craig right. went through all of his art and carefully peeled the rubber cement balloons off of all the art, put it in an envelope, and <laughs> sent it to Marv, <laughs> and kept the art for the book himself. <laughs> and I just always thought, like, wow, things were always that simple that you could just peel it off. <laughs> it was just a 
It was just a funny story, and I was oh, I was God, yeah. pretty young when I'd heard that. I, I guess maybe I, it was because I think that thing had come out. Was that in the late seventies or something? Yeah, but, yeah. So, I believe, is it is it, and maybe it's a different story. But there was that one. Um, there's something disturbing you, see, Stephen. Was mm-hmm. kind of the mantra of the story, or what is it that disturbs you, yeah. Stephen? That's what it is. And I, I don't know if that's the same story or not. I have heard that story before. I'm really glad you're retelling it because it is awesome. And especially knowing the different personalities of Craig and Marv, man, I would love to be a fly on the wall during that conversation. Well, I, I mean, at the, time, at the time when they had that art thing, I wasn't even in comics, but I remember thinking, yeah, this doesn't seem fair. Sure. You know? uh, yeah. and, and again, the argument is is who makes the rules. And if the the editors are all writers, well, then it's kind of skewed towards the writer, you know? So I just thought, I thought that was just a funny, uh, funny protest. That just, that, that always oh, grabbed totally. me. So when I, when I finally saw him in person and we we're hanging around, I said, oh, I got to thank you for that. That I don't know if that was true or not. And he's like, Oh no, it was true. <laughs> he kind of corrected. Said that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yes. So it was, yeah, fun. that's awesome. man. Well, you know, <laughs> all right, Jerry, you just opened the door that I want to go into for a second. When wizard came out, especially the early issues, they would list the credits of a comic, artist first, then writer. Mm-hmm. And I know this was during the 90s, and, you know, obviously the the big speculation boom, and it was obviously the art that was leading right. that speculation and stuff like that. So was that an actual, because of all the speculation stuff going on, was that a a shift of power, or not, you know what I'm saying, I guess yeah. employee power yeah. um, to the artist, yeah. and, and was it a very different decade than the others? Well, here's what it was to me, and I I, I remember I did it on my books when I yeah. was doing, I think, I forget if I started it when I was working with Grummet, I think on uh, Power, on um, Adventures of Superman, Tom was drawing okay. it. I think I started it then. Uh, but Byrne is the guy, the first guy I saw do it. John started doing it, as I recall, on Iron Man when he was working with uh, Ramita Jr. Okay. That he started crediting Ramita Jr. And he re- put the art credit ahead of the writer credit. And the justification for it has always been that Marvel style, as opposed to someone writing a full script that said, panel one, you know, page two, sure. uh, so-and-so, here's what they say, everything's there for you, you just have to be an art monkey and draw to make the word balloons work. <laughs> well, and this is true. It's a more technical okay. thing. Okay. But if, when you're working Marvel style, you don't have the word balloons. You don't have anything. You have no real acting. You just have an outline of what's supposed to happen. And you're taking whatever is there and you're fleshing it out because it's a harder job than you can imagine, especially when you used to have to break the, the stuff down by pages. Because sure. Sometimes, you know, you you really had to edit a lot. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I would get plots on, um, even when I was working on Superman initially, uh, or with Roy, even with the All-Star Squadron, when I was drawing that, a lot of the times the plots would be a lot of pages, but they were more than you could fit in, basically. So it would be like someone would just, you know, and, and Marv did this on Superman as well, You would if you tried really hard to get everything that they wanted in there, you'd have 12 panel pages. So it was an editing job. You had to say, well, how important is it that this panel ha- or that this sequence happens and that sequence? So you had to do basically an adaptation of someone's outline, which is a lot more work. And it's more gratifying because you're then, you're in charge of the story. You're like driving the car. You know I mean? You're no longer you're the director. The back. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly. the director and, and the, the, the writer is the screenwriter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the writer then seize your pencils and you would make margin notes to make sure that they so that it could follow he could follow whatever you know rather than going back to the plot he could follow it so the margin notes would then inform what the intent is with each panel or maybe what somebody's talking about or they're they're angry they're you know whatever so they had that that guideline so they they initiated it if they were the sole writer and now co-plotting they would initiate that plot but then once the artist had it the artist would would really really adapt it um, so that happened with Kirby, that happened with Steve Ditko, that happened with John Buscema. Those guys, all yes. those Marvel guys did that. They Ramita, would take something that was, right, Ramita, uh, all of them. They, they take yeah. Don Heck, they take something that was a quick idea and they would fill out and basically tell a story over 20 pages or 22 pages. Sure. That seemed to be, not that one's more important, but that's a bigger chunk of the work. 
that's where I think Burns, sure. you know, Burns started with because he was working with Romita Jr. I think he inherited the book from another writer, but John Romita Jr. had lots of story ideas. Just like when I was working with John, we when we were doing the Superman stuff. We were co-plotting it, and it wasn't always every issue was fifty-fifty. But you know, you're throwing a lot of ideas into it, so it sure. was a def- in deference to that. So when I started writing with Tom, I think I did it with Tom Grumman on Adventures, but I definitely did it after that on uh, Power Shazam as well. And it was just okay. pretty much just a a statement that yes, I value what your contribution is. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I know today in in the creator creator owned world. Uh, literally uh, all of my uh, interviews, and I, and I'm really glad we're talking to you because sometimes it's like, well, John only talks to writers. I'm like, no, that's not true, and I won't deny, as uh, coming from a broadcast writing standpoint, yeah. that sometimes, I, especially early on, I was talking more to writers and stuff. Yeah. But no, I um I do know the creator owned people that I talk to now are very much uh, both when I talk to the artist and the writer. It's like, oh, no, 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 you like, you know, Jerome and Pena and Tony Moore were crucial to Fear Agent yeah. for Rick Remender, yeah, yeah. pulling two na- three names out of my ass. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, and Nick uh, Darrington, when he's worked with uh, Hickman on their on their creator-owned stuff and right. all these other people, it's like, you know, yeah, it's it's well, definitely the, And a, here's a the thing. Load. I've been in it long enough to see the wave. Like, when I was working at D.C., they, D.C. was always full script. And there's like right. reasons for having a full script because basically, if the writer writes his script with the balloons and with all the, you know, all the direction to it, he gets paid right then when he turns it in. With a with a plot first, you have to wait till the artist does the pencils, and then you get the second half of the payment when you do the dialogue. So, you know, from a physical point of view, it's a different setup. When wow. Roy Thomas and Marv Wolfman and Doug Mensch. And Jerry Conway switched, went from Marvel to DC. To DC, they were all used to work in plot style. So when I worked at, at DC, I don't think I ever worked on a full script until the days of the early 2000s. That's the first time I ever had a full script, a complete script with balloons in it and everything else. And it's a it's a harder, a more technical way of having to work because it's it's it always felt more organic to be the guy to set up the panel order and to be the guy who you know for an artistic reason joe blow is on the left and and jane doe is on the right it would dictate who speaks first you know what i'm saying there's a lot of like when you get a full script and you have multiple panels of the same people in the same scene you have to arrange your panel based on who speaks first really uh so you have to leave room for stuff and you have to block out where the balloons would go it dictates your actual panel arrangement and your 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 visual setup, so it it, it takes a little of the fun away, you know. As a, as somebody who always, I mean, I, I I always felt like I always contribute something, even on a full script. I'll throw in stuff with characters acting or using props or something, you know, kind of acting like. Um, but with a you know again plot style, it, it, a lot of the, more of the burden is on the artist. So it uh, it just felt like that was in the air at that time, and that happened bef- really before Image, a couple of years yeah. before. But Image really happened, I think, more so because that initial group of guys. And I know Jim Lee, I think, had to be talked into it, but the Todd McFarlane and Rob and uh, yeah. Eric Larson were all on board as, and Jim Valentino was like, yeah, wait we're doing the lion's share of the work and and their issue was that the royalties were cut differently so that's what started image was the fact that in in comics when royalties started the writer got a share the penciler got a share and the inker got a share well the penciling and inking share was generally bigger at marvel than the writer share at dc the writer share was bigger than the penciling inking share combined at dc so each company had a different thing, and it, none of that mattered if you were working on a book that wasn't making a big royalty. Sure. Once a couple of these books started selling big royalties, people then were going, wait, I made this great amount of money, but the guy who wrote this, who didn't put as much work into it, sure. he made you know, one and a half times what I made. Is that fair? So sure. that's, that's really where that argument, I think, kind of became politicized to a degree as opposed to just being 
uh, totally about creativity or whatever. It, it, it became an issue of making money for a writer, <laughs> you know? And it yeah, was justified yeah. to a degree, but, you know, hey, uh, all the years that I worked in comics, when I got writing, when I first started writing, it mm-hmm. was an uphill battle because people, I mean, guys like Byrne and Walt Simonson and Frank Miller kind of brought that, I mean, Starlin, too, had brought that writing back to the artist, whereas it yes. used to be a thing. I mean, it was certainly a thing for Will Eisner. It was certainly a thing during different times in comic history. Um, and the, in the, the time, in those days, the writers were afraid. And I know I talked to different writers during that time frame. It's like, wow, all the good artists are leaving, which meant they were no longer going to have access to these good artists, as opposed to oh, I hate image or I hate, you know, whatever, they were just losing collaborators who were making sure. them look good. Yeah. Know, because a good artist is going to make your story better. Of you course, know? absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, it, it's it's just weird. There are so many things at play during that time. And unfortunately, the snapback from the market collapse was that it it did kind of eventually wind up putting the writers back in the forefront, which... They always should be equal. I always felt it always should be an equal thing. You shouldn't mention Tom King without mentioning whoever's drawing the thing that he worked on. And I think yeah. Tom would agree. Oh know? yeah. Well, um, you know, I just had I had I had Tom Mitch and uh, Doc on. Oh, uh, oh. They're doing the new Adam Strange. The, right, right. The is that Strange Adventures? Is it Strange Adventures. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it looks it's amazing, honestly. And I, I were you an Adam Strange guy as a kid? No, no, it was, that was Marvel Maniac at that point. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> although I did, I drew a, I drew an Adam Strange story that Grant Morrison wrote for one of the Julie Schwartz. Uh, oh, the kind tribute, of tribute stuff. comics. And, yeah, uh, holy shit! I got to dig that up, man. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was fun. It was the I think that's the only time I worked with uh, Grant. With Grant directly. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, I can um, only imagine. That's it. I look forward to checking it out, man. I have. I, well, again, now you know. Again, we're close in the, in the same age. Didn't you think by the time we were in our fifties as a little kid? Didn't you think? Well, oh, we'll probably have jetpacks. I mean, jet, everyone will have a jetpack <laughs> eventually. I thought for yeah. certain. I mean, between Thunderball yeah, and yeah, all yeah. those halftime shows of guys tooling right. around in jetpacks, I'm like, yeah, they'll, all right. You know, this is the seventies. I'm like, yeah. yeah, forty years from now, they'll figure it out. Sure well, flying will. flying cars. Yes. You know? Well, but I don't know why. I was really hoping more for the jetpack than I was the flying car. I got to be honest. Man. <laughs> well, you know what though? The problem is, as a fifty-year-old, or in my case, as a sixty-year-old, I feel kind of like I can see the inherent horrible danger of, <laughs> of a flying car or a jetpack. I think of the well, same thing is true of right of, of of the drones. You know, the the it, once the once you got Amazon and all these. Uh, food services delivering stuff by drone. I mean, how long is it going to be before some drone takes off the top of your head while you're walking down oh, the totally, street? Totally. You know? or, blow, or literally blow out your ass with a jetpack or something like that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. That's uh, <laughs> well, yeah, with the jetpack, no. you just need you just need those asbestos pants, and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're halfway there, Jim. We are halfway there. It could actually, help. and I always say it's like, all right, we got the supercomputers in our pockets. That's pretty cool. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> But, you know, because that was the other thing, watching uh, 66 Batman. I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have your own computer like that? That would be amazing. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Well, didn't they do that? And they did something. I was trying to remember where they did that the first time I saw it, where Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne, had like a big computer set up in his trunk of his car. Wasn't that like in the 70s that they well, first it showed that? Well, definitely on the Adam West show. Are I they, remember. I remember the not on the show, but I mean, I thought it was in the comics for some reason. I I, I want to say there was something where I remember, sure. like, maybe even during the Neil Adams era where he, he's got sure. some kind of a computer or something in there. I was like, well, there you go. You get your mobile computer. Or that <laughs> now, awesome. Now we have, like, a little watch, <laughs> you know. That awesome sports car version of the Batmobile that they yep. had in that uh, Frank Robbins and Neil Adams and Irv Novik. Uh, yeah, that was a great yeah. era. That yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. You know, and honestly, I'm uh, – and then, again, as, as an Invaders artist yourself and stuff like that – Frank Robbins, it fascinated the hell out of He was another slow burn like the Joker, where initially I'm like, oh, this is ugly. Oh. <laughs> but then, really, I kept buying Invaders, and yeah. I'm like, there is something happening here in this art. Even 12-year-old me knew it was, you know, it's like, That's wait a funny. minute, this is cool. See, I never, I mean, I remember buying the first couple issues, because I did have them in my collection. 
um, of the invaders. But then I just never liked the Vince Coletta combo. So I never read past that point. But when I was doing the in advance of doing the invaders thing with Roy in, uh, this, in last, last spring, I yeah. was, I went and I, I had bought you, the two trade paperbacks that Marvel sure. had done. The uh, collections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I reread all those and it made me <laughs> understand what he was doing in All-Star Squadron more, you know, that, cause I really didn't have a, a reference point for what he was doing in All-Star Squadron at the time, but he was doing wow. pretty much the same thing in the Invaders. I just didn't realize sure. it. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, Weaving man, like they... real stuff in. But you know, right. here, with, with, with Frank Robbins, the thing that's fun is, I had an earlier experience with Frank Robbins via him doing those Man Bat stories sure. when he was writing them. But he was he drew a couple of those Batmans during the, I think it was the era when maybe right before Archie Goodwin took over the Batman book, the Detective Comics. Mm-hmm. But in yeah. that time frame, and then Frank Robbins did like I think he did a Shadow or a couple of issues of Shadow where he actually pencil linked himself, and I preferred that as wonky as that stuff was. It was like seeing Lee Elias inking himself, as opposed to having someone else ink those guys, because they had a they had a, a, an all over approach. It was like an inker would kind of maybe water it down, and and that was probably the intent. Yes. I'm sure. Yes, you know, Roy no, wanted you, yeah. Coletta to make it look a little more superhero like or something, and but it was just always fighting itself to me it, when I when I looked at those books, I and I could never totally appreciate it. But yeah, Frank well, Robbins inking himself was always aces. I just thought he was. Uh, it yeah. was wonky, weird. You know, if you if you can love like Todd McFarlane, <laughs> you know, uh, like Marvel age stuff yeah. when he was yeah. doing Hulk or whatever, you you could appreciate Frank Robbins because they were trying to do something very different. Whether you know they weren't appealing to the masses, I don't think. Well, and his I, I love Johnny Hazard, his comic strip. Oh yeah, yeah. That for people who don't know it, think uh, and, and no disrespect meant for Frank Robbins. Poor man, Steve Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Because essentially it was the same kind of foreign entry format of, you know, kind of a, a guy going around getting jobs all over the yeah. world. And, oh, God, I love his Johnny Hazard. And you're right because, you know, and, and I'm always defending Vinny Coletta. In fact, I think Mitch and I were talking about Vinny uh, a couple of days ago. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I, well, Vinny, I, 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 I mean, know. the problem. Did you ever know him? What's that? Did you ever know him or meet him? Yeah, I have, I have one in, 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 one personal contact, which wasn't great. I, I went to to DC. I went to to New York City from my Mike Macklin and I. I drove from Wisconsin to Rhode Island. We met up with a guy in Rhode Island who had some kind of contact to get us into DC and to Marvel. So he drove my car then from Rhode Island to New York City in 1977, right before the. I guess it was like in the summer, maybe July ish or early July. Um. And I set up an appointment at Marvel. Well, Marvel wasn't seeing anybody. Nobody could get into Marvel. So Jim Shooter came out of the lobby uh, to the lobby and talked to me and to Mike. And he gave us a bunch of Xeroxes of people's pencils for whatever mm-hmm. they were getting ready to get rid of that had been inked. Books that, you know, they keep the pencils as long as the artwork is in transit or whatever. Once the artwork completed and in-house and statted, they could get rid of the pencil Xeroxes. So he gave us a stack. Wow which was cool, and we learned yeah. a lot from that. We went, yeah. so we got no work from them, but then we went to, to D.C. where I had an appointment with Vinnie Coletta, who was the art director at the time. Okay, yeah. And uh, I, Vinny, it was such a frustrating thing. An official appointment, so I brought pages of my Messenger comic, which I, the only thing I really had, I didn't do specific samples, but I had written, drawn, and inked like a 10-page Messenger story. This is my own okay. character. Mm-hmm. And that was my sample, 1977. And Coletta is sitting there, and he's in a leisure suit. And I want to think it was either tan or kind of pale green, like a seafoam. Classic, right? absolutely. <laughs> and, Avocado. Uh, <laughs> and he's looking at these, and he's going, I can't see the pencils. I can't see the pencils. And I'm like, well, it, I penciled and inked it. No, I just want to look at pencils. And I'm like, okay, nobody told me that. I just drove, you know, 1,000-plus miles <laughs> I can't drive home and get pencils. And he's like, right. "Go do, come back and bring me some pencils. And I said, well, can you judge the inks? Can you give me a, like a critique on the inks? I'm not looking at inks. <laughs> and that was it. So wow. I, had this, I had this just like, weep, wow. You know, like, oh, yeah. I came all this way. And uh, it, it didn't turn out well for me. 
But I got to meet at DC's office. I got to meet uh, Joe Staden, super nice guy. It was my wow. Uh, he was nice. Got to meet Al Milgram, although you know Al right. was not long. I believe for both DC. of them were at Terrificon last year. But yep. go on. And Al was was, was fired soon after that in a DC implosion. So Al was. Wow! Uh, yeah. I never knew Al worked at DC. He I, was I an editor. Was he was an editor. It was around the time that they he and Conway did the uh, Firestorm initially, but oh, Al wow. was also an editor. And hey, Larry Hama, briefly. There was like uh, both editors, both of them let go during the uh, at the implosion. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. And Mike Macklin was was Mike, Mike looked Macklin. like Mike was coming up aces because Mike Al wanted to hire Mike to take over layouts on All Star Comics, which Wally Wood at the time was still the finisher on. Gotcha. And, yes. And uh, was Giffen, Paul was was, was before Giffen Keith, doing the... right before Keith. So so oh, was, okay, go on. He was taking over oh, for wow. Rick Estrada. Oh, okay, sure. Yes. Time. So Al is going to say, "Hey, Mike, you know, I'm going to give you a script. You go back to Wisconsin, and then you do pages, some pages for me. And if this works out, great." So Mike is like riding on cloud nine, as we used to say yeah. it back in the yeah. 1920s. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Paul Levitz comes over and he looks down and he goes, we don't have enough work for the people we got. Uh, you can't be hiring anybody. So there, that ended that. So Mike and I and our friend from Rhode Island went to a liquor store <laughs> and each bought a bottle. The guy driving, the, he, didn't, he, he didn't have a bottle, but Mike and I, I each bought a bottle of booze and we drank on the... You know, two hour, three whatever, two and a half hour drive back to to Rhode Island to, to drown our sorrows. Yeah, man. Um, but oh, yeah, that was my my Vinnie Coletta thing. And, and <laughs> I, I every time I told that story, people have said Vinnie Coletta wearing a leisure suit. And I'm like, you got to understand, leisure suits were like the hot, trendy right. thing at that time. And they're like, no, no, I never saw Vinnie in anything but a a tailored, you know, uh, Armani or some kind of fancy oh, suit. Interesting. And wow. I asked everybody of that era, and they all were like, no, I don't think so. And I finally found one guy, who Tom Siaka, who uh, was a f- fan artist. And Tom actually was doing backgrounds for Vinny at, around that era, in that, like, 74, 75, okay. whatever. And he's, or maybe 76, somewhere around there. But he, he did confirm to me that, yeah, Vinny did wear leisure suits because they were the height of fashion. Right? <laughs> oh, dude, you you remember, I love watching The Six Million Dollar Man. Oh, right. Because it's, it's the history of the leisure, the leisure suit from <laughs> yeah. 72 to like, you know, 78 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, I had, know you're right. I man. had a leisure totally. suit. My mom thought she was doing me such a big favor because I usually, like when you're, when I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of money and I always wound up wearing, if I had to wear a suit coat to someone's funeral, it was always like a hand me down sure. from my much larger and older brother Mike, who was six foot three, and I was still growing. So I'd have these suits that were the arms were really long and stuff. So when I graduated um, high school, uh, was it? Yeah, yeah, nineteen seventy five. I graduated high school. My mom made this gesture and bought me a leisure suit at uh, Sears, sure. and, and it was like tan. It sure. was the pants and this and this coat and they you know people anybody who has any doubts about what a, how, how futuristic a leisure suit was in 1975, it really was like what you would see in maybe even Soil and Green or some, some of those movies right. that were future right. based because they weren't it wasn't like a collar thing it was more like a almost like a shirt over a shirt you know yeah with and pockets. very unconventional compared to <laughs> traditional suits. For people who have never seen these suits before, absolutely. <laughs> but opposed to looking at, like, if you're going looking for, you know, artistic reference, and you wind up uh, looking at like True. fashion sites or GQ, you're not going to probably see a leisure suit. But if you're, you know, honest, it's like this is what people wore because they sold them in Sears and they sold them at J.C. Right. Penney. Right. Oh, like you said, <laughs> man, no, no. There's pictures of me in leisure suits from the '70s. No question, especially little kids. Because that was a cheap way to dress them up and everything, and yeah, it was accepted. Uh, no, I agree. There's uh, Rosemont, Rosemont, Illinois, the Donald Stevens Center. Don Stevens himself, uh-huh. who was a longtime mayor of Rosemont, and a rather shady character, is the last guy, like, I remember in, like, 1988 or 89, him wearing a leisure suit at some <laughs> public event. That's and funny. And yeah, it's, you know, yikes. And then kind of had the same background that Vinny supposedly had as well. So we'll leave it at that for people who can read between the lines. So too uh, funny, that is man. funny, though. Funny. I mean, there's a there's a style trend that 
You know, like I said, it, 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 when you're an artist and you're looking for, like, you know, like I said, I drew a story set in 1946. I immediately start looking at what are people dressed in, especially women's styles change more drastically, I think, than men's. But, you know, I wanted to see what suit styles, what, you know, what would people be wearing for the background stuff. And, you know, you do run into the, the trick of if you start looking at Vogue or you start looking at high-end stuff, it's the same as now. Like, look at a a fashion show in New York that maybe just happened and you go, okay, none of that stuff ever is going to hit the street. That's like just the there high for shock value. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, and even back then it was like that with Vogue and everything? Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it, there were high-end things and those, those, if you ever look at those, like they're, they look futuristic, but they never became streetwear. You know, that's, sure. that's the, the lesson is that, you know, people generally would shop, again, you would be shopping at a department store. You know, you're not going right, to be shopping, shopping at uh, at some designer store or whatever. So. No, no, absolutely not. No, no. <laughs> and like cars, so, uh, people have cars for 15, 20 years. So, you know, if you draw a 1946 story, you're not going to draw all 1946 cars. You're going right. to draw maybe a couple, but most of them are going to be from the earlier, you know, 10 years earlier even. You know, Well, and also production had shut down during the war and everything right. went into tanks and planes. And a so, lot of them were, they weren't, they weren't even updated too. So they're probably, if they were, if they were making any, they were probably using the same uh, assembly Gosh. lines the way they yeah. were, you know, yeah. Yeah, in the late 30s and in the early 40s, absolutely, pre-war. No, I think you're right. Interesting. I was going to ask regarding the name of our story and the all-winner squad. Um, so do we have depowered Captain America, who's really Jeff Mace the Patriot? Yeah, but they don't, I mean, again, none of those, the in, the involvement of those characters is all in superhero Minimal. efforts as opposed, so there's no alter egos mentioned. Right. But yeah, no, but I'm saying like, this, so that at exactly. no point, at no point there's an interaction with Namor and Cap, where they're you know, it's Jeff anything. Mace as yeah. opposed to Steve. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. I loved, I think Kiesel did that great miniseries a couple of years ago. Yep. That really, yeah, went into like Jeff Mace's Captain America, and I mean, as as you did as well, I'm sure those what ifs from the '70s, the first run of what if, mm-hmm. uh, God, those Invader stories were just awesome. Yeah, and I, I mean, always, and I loved when Brubaker put it in the continuity and stuff with his Winter Soldier run. Oh yeah, and he had that gr- he had that great moment at uh, Arlington Cemetery with the Eternal Flames, and they were the tributes to uh, both the Spirit of '76 and Jeff Mace, right. Well, you know, so the, I love that. did you yeah. ever, I just, when I was, again, I do this with, I wanted to get, just refresh myself on as much as I could. So I pull probably every 1940s set thing that might apply. And I wound up reading the Brubaker and Epting had done, um, was it the Marvel's Project? Was that what it was called? It was like a 12 yeah. issue mini series. I love that book. And that Absolutely. Was, yeah, yeah, that was really nice. And, um, and expanded all the timely, like all the backup heroes yep. that were in those Human Torch and Submariner books and everything. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, and it's nice, <clears throat> you know, when someone could take something that, it, like Rubik did a great job with that because he took something that pre-existed, but they also added stuff in that didn't exist. You know, I mean, I, oh, I yeah. think that's that's kind of cool. I, speaking of that, the current book that I'm loving tremendously is the Indestructible Hulk. I um, I kept buying it. Mitch had told me, oh, this is pretty good, and I was buying it, and they were stacking up. And I realized that I was buying it, and I hadn't read any of them. So I just sat down, and I think I read like four or five of them each day and read through the uh, up-to-current run. And it's an amazing book in the same way, I mean, if I were to – it's nicely drawn. Uh, it, it's got some really great ideas in it, but they turn the Hulk yep. into, into a monster book. Which yep. is very appropriate. Absolutely, um, it is. Of course, it is. But a really, really nicely done, and and it just it's outstanding in the same way to me. As I was reading it, with the use of taking what was old and putting a f- fresh spin on it, in the same way that like I think Jeff Johns did with his Green Lantern run when he came up with the multiple color spectrum yeah. lanterns. Yeah. It was like, well, cool. this idea was always there, waiting for somebody to find it. You know, and like with the Hulk, uh, Al Ewing is just finding all kinds of little pieces in stories that existed years ago and, and new stuff as well. It's just it's fascinating. Just uh, I, uh, I agree. Absolutely. It's amazing. You know, it's, he's 
the Hulk is his most dangerous he's been in years yeah. in Al Ewing's hands. I completely agree. It's incredible. And I haven't had Al Ewing on the show yet, and I, that's one of my you know projects where it's like you got to got to meet and get Al Ewing on the show. That's got to happen. <laughs> And yeah, I have enough, you know, mutual uh, people that he's worked with that would likely at least introduce me to him. And yeah, no, it's a, no, it's a nice run. It's a nice run. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than that, I've been reading little snippets of things, but mostly I've been reading a lot of Marvel stuff. And that's uh, cool. I've been enjoying. No, cool. I've been enjoying the uh, the current storyline in the Captain America books. Um, kind Tana of reinvisioning it. Stuff? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's re- the, the new story. Uh, I read the his run from the beginning and I liked mm-hmm. it but I felt like this new story reads like a really good crime novel you know what I mean right. uh, oh that's cool yeah it, it's it seems more representative of that type of like a Jack Reacher book or a you cool. know it just it's got that that which I really like I mean those are my some of my favorite I like uh, the Michael Connelly stuff and the um, you know like the Jack Reacher as a character is great the books are always fun yeah. uh michael Connolly with harry bosch and, and all those i like those a lot so were you were you ever a spencer novel fan i read a bunch of them um i think he was too prolific for me you know what i mean i think H. robert parker was too yeah yeah prolific yeah because he wrote so many of those spencer books they're really fun and i actually wound up sampling more of them at one point i had a friend who was loaning me audiobooks because the, the guy um uh, a friend of mine who used to own Cave Comics, Pat Callanan, his wife at the time was on a long commute, so she would buy audiobooks, and she was a big Spencer fan. So he would say, hey, she listened to these once, you know, do you want to borrow them? So while I was drawing, I'd put the seat, you know, when they're on CDs or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I listened to uh, probably, you know, 20, <laughs> 20 of them or whatever. And they were, Spencer novels. They're really well, well written, and I, I enjoyed them. But, oh, uh, God, yeah. Well, have you seen, I don't know if you saw on Netflix, Mark Wahlberg is doing, and let's put it in comic terms, a Spencer Year One story. Oh, interesting. Uh, and it's apparently when he first meets Hawk, uh, who was played by Avery Brooks for yeah, yeah, that listening, was... you know, on, on the TV show. And a quintessential Hawk got to tell Avery Brooks that, and it's one of the best nerd moments of my life being able to tell him that. <laughs> well, that's uh, pretty cool. But, oh, it was excellent. And Avery Brooks movie, from Star, Star Trek TV. So. Oh, Yes, indeed, Captain Cisco. I know, man. I'm. A, I uh, we're we're in two hours. I don't want. I, I don't know how much time you have left because I could easily go another two talking about Star Trek. And I know I'm talking to I'm talking to Mike Allred's kid. Uh, and this is a good tease for Word Balloon, everybody. Although I'm not sure which one I'll release first. But uh, Mike Allred's son is uh, making a, a documentary about Mike, and he's oh, cool. going to do a Kickstarter for it and everything. But anyway. Uh, I, I, if have you seen this trailer for this Spencer movie? No, no, I haven't. Is it a movie oh, or is it going to be a series? I th- I think it's going to be a Netflix movie. Oh, okay. And I, it looks like it's going to be, and especially given Wahlberg, Wahlberg likely is, you know, I well, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. I, I haven't had any, an opportunity to talk to an actor about what's it like doing a you know a ten a ten episode yeah. TV show versus a six month movie. Yeah. How, how much of a production time and shooting time difference is there? Yeah. I don't really know. Well, I think but, they, um, with a TV show, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was going to say, with the, the so way they're seen the, it yet, I want you to see it. The Go way ahead. they're doing these things, these shows, um, the Netflix model, so to speak, or yeah. FX model, like FX was doing with right. uh, Fargo and things like that, is they sure. the, the same thing, HBO model. It's like they would write the full season of scripts. So they weren't like writing as they go along, like on a regular series where you have 30, ep- 20 episodes or whatever, where right. they're writing it ahead, but they're still not writing the end of it all at once. With these shows, they write ten episodes, and then I think they film based on that too, so they can make it more economical to film. Like certain actors who may not be in the whole thing, they can film almost all of their scenes. They can do it much more economically. So I think that's why probably more movie actors are even doing it because obviously TV's in a resurgence era. You know, a oh god, yeah, prime TV era. It's like it's good to do a TV show, and if if you're taking the same time and you normally do two movies a year, you can do that one movie and you can do a 10-episode show. You're going to help your fan base, but also you're going to be able to do something different, you know? Totally agree. No, I absolutely about that. I uh, 
Oh god, that just reminded me of something else I wanted to ask you. But yeah, I was really interested if you've if you've seen it yet. It disappoints me in the way, or it potentially might disappoint me based on the trailer, in the way that when Jason Statham did that uh Parker was it yeah, Parker yeah, movie. Yeah. And it was just like, Oh no, that's not who he No, no, Lee Marvin, man. That, yeah. uh, Lee Marvin got it right. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> But no, I um oh I know I was gonna ask a couple of things. Uh, as we're talking, did you did well? First of all, the Crisis crossover. I meant to talk about that when we we're talking about your covers and stuff. What did you think of the TV show? I enjoyed it. I think that for it, I mean, you know, going into it, that they're going to be limited in what they can do. Sure. And they did more than I thought they would. Like they had the giant anti monitor in that last part, and they did, you know, they did some clever stuff. The yeah. only thing, the only feeling of at the very end, I felt like they shot themselves in the foot because. It seemed like the entire goal of this was to streamline everything into one world, and that was fine, and it looked like that, but then they, they did that added thing where they showed all the other worlds that still exist, including the Earth-2 one, and the, you know what I mean? Right. It was like right. somebody, it, it, it felt almost more like zero hour than it felt like crisis That's towards true. that end, you know? <laughs> like it was, right. it was not the winnowing down, but it was the culling and relaunching of things i guess but uh, i guess i um but i'm looking forward I, to star girl i think that uh, that yeah, little bit that i've seen looked just really amazing oh no and i i mean you know that's jeff's passion one of jeff's passion oh projects, yeah so he's gonna pull and put everything into it absolutely um and that no i agree with you my one thing artistically man i hate to nitpick because i enjoyed it but that final scene that final fight with the end monitor Given that it was done in daylight on rooftops yeah. and stuff, I'm like, oh, this should be in outer space, man. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That was my only little thing. So, but I no, think, it was fun. All the stunt casting was ridiculously great. Yeah, it was. I was, I was really, really amused to see the Flash and Flash meet. You know, and I think Mitch was talking. We were talking about that, and he said that was the. I guess that was where the Flash from the movie universe actually yeah. gets named because they never named him. And he goes, Slash, oh, that's a good name. Something like that. I totally missed that. <laughs> it went by yeah, really he fast. he did say that. Yes, I do remember hearing that dialogue. Absolutely. So that's yeah. funny. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought it was, again, I, I mean, it's a, you, you can only appreciate if you're probably any of the people working on it or Mark Guggenheim or whatever, how big of an undertaking it is for a TV show to get production on something like that. Oh, it, God, yes. I mean, it's it's just you're you're melding what probably – four or five different production teams and writers and casts right. to try yes. to be on the same page. And it's, I think that that has to be a, a real difficult behind the scenes task. So uh, uh, agreed. They, and their I, budget, and they still have their budget yeah. considerations and stuff. So I thought it was, it definitely exceeded what I thought they could do with it. Um, and it was fun. So I, I, I liked it. I give it a big thumbs up. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I'm, I'm letting Mark decompress and I'm not going to bother him, but, um, we we've known each other for years, and then uh, once again, Terrificon, uh, we shared a, a limo back to the airport. Oh, cool! Uh, and and spent the whole time talking excitedly about what was coming with this Christ, uh, crossover. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, yeah, he's like, they're finally letting us do what we've always wanted to do, and we're really going nuts with the stunt casting. And I'm like, <laughs> that's fantastic, you know. So it was great to like, you know, his excitement, and I'm like, oh, you you knew it was going to be great. <laughs> um, and this is like a year before. I mean, it wasn't this yeah. past August; it was two August. Yeah, ago. yeah. That he was talking again because they were going to get to finally write it and everything yeah, yeah. and do it. So well, yeah, no, I met. I actually know. worked with Mark on JSA, be, right before the new Fifty Two. Yes, wiped or Flashpoint wiped everything out. So I think I did like two and a half issues. The last oh, was it that short of a run, man? The, the okay. last couple of issues of that JSA run, which was was kind of funny. Didn't they bury Alan Scott in the story and everything? Did um, he die? He was. I forget what. I don't think they killed him. I think I. I, I don't think they needed to end anything. I just they were resolving a storyline. But it was that weird era where Alan Scott's costume looked like a giant, like he was a giant lantern. It was the craziest. Yes. You know, yes. like how you have to adapt to the times. I remember looking at that and going, "Wait, <laughs> that's his costume? What am I doing?" It's like that's hyperbaric like Superman, chamber, man. I was never. I was never a fan of Red and Blue Superman in the nineties. I'm like, this is not a good idea. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. Well, and I was. I'm happy to say I wasn't on the books at that time. And... At a boy, <laughs> <laughs> dodge that bullet, Jesus. <laughs> boy, Alan Scott. Remember too when they de-aged him and he was Sentinel. Yeah, and he was young and everything. Right. <laughs> 
They well, did a lot of crazy shit with Alan Scott. I, I and I again like cornerstone all American comics hero and stuff. Yeah. I mean, my God, you know. Well, like when so. I was when I was working on the JSA stuff, I did a bunch of fill in stuff. I was kind of like the regular fill in couple pages each issue guy for a while on uh, Jeff Johns's run towards the end and uh, I always loved the core um, old guy characters I loved the Alan uh, the Jay Garrick flash I loved Wildcat I loved the, what he did with those guys so they were just Great. fun characters to to work with and work on and I had you know the, I could see them in my close my eyes and I could see what they look like you know as old people, because I did that in All Star Squadron as young people, and then I did them as older characters in Infinity Inc. So um, I always felt like it was a shame that that core group just disappeared like that. You know, that, that, that was my my biggest issue with New Fifty Two was wait, there's fifty two Earths, and Earth Two can't be one of them. You know? Yeah, no, I agree <laughs> with that too. Yeah, but, no, man, and I and. Um... No, the I, I what I love mostly about the GSA run that that Jeff and James Robinson started and David Goyer uh, for writers and you know Don Kramer was on there too and yep. Dale Eaglesham and wonderful creators all top to bottom. Christ, even that Alex Russ, uh, Steve King Sadowski too. He was a penciler. Steve for a Sadowski, long time. absolutely, man. Very cool. Well, um, but I yeah, I was always I I just liked their role pre fifty two of being. You know, like the mentors, yeah. and then really like, no, we've been doing it forever. We know how to do this. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, that's what they should be doing. And it was never a, yeah, right now you kids go out and play. Grandpa's going to sit in the rocking chair. Right. No, they were still doing it. Right, and the stories were terrific. Oh yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a huge. No, I agree with you, man. I love those. It's those costumes too. Well, you know what's funny is when I was work as I worked on the first run of the of the JSA. Um, yeah. All, or I'll start when Don Kramer when that era and Sadowski, oh, okay. I did like a two part fill in with Sandman. What was uh, it had the uh, Hector Hall as the Sandman, the Kirby, you know, the, the, the Kirby Austin Sandman. One. Yes, yes, I and, remember that story. Uh, and uh, it was really fun. I remember having a conversation with Jeff and saying that I thought it would be kind of fun to do a story. And it's just an idea I had. I said it would be kind of fun to do. Like Firebrand, because that's a character from All Star Squadron. What yeah, happened sure. to Firebrand? Well, what if Danny. she's an you know older lady, right? And she's actually being a mentor to new heroes. It was my my idea. I just thought it would be a fun, like a be an interesting little story or whatever. And that didn't happen. But then when Jeff did his that last incarnation of JSA, it was like, wait, there's Ma Uncle. And there's the the other JSA guys, Flash and and, and Wildcat, yeah. and they're being mentors to the new heroes. And I was like, huh, I wonder if I put that in his ear, you know. <laughs> but uh, but I never got to see uh, Firebrand. I was always disappointed, you know. I was going to say, what was the Firebrand story? I'm bummed that that didn't happen. No. Do you remember at the end of um, of James's uh, Starman run mm-hmm. when Ted Knight dies, and they have the funeral for Ted Knight, and. Um, this little old lady comes up and she's like, "Hi, you don't remember me all, but I was Phantom Lady." Uh-oh. And literally looks like Grandma Moses. Oh, that's it's hilarious. Funny. And especially given the especially the 40s through the uh, <laughs> 90s design of Phantom Lady and stuff, it's like, "Whoa." <laughs> well, I was, when you mentioned that, my immediate brain image was a Don Martin with an old lady with her boobs <laughs> down to her knees, <laughs> in, you know, like in a frock or a house coat or something. <laughs> Of course, absolutely. But in the comics, they made they made Sandra Knight Ted Knight's uh, cousin. That's hilarious. Uh, That's like um, I remember. Um, I want to say Mark Texera did a uh, convention commission of Aunt May coming out of the shower. <laughs> And that's all that needs to be said. Yeah, yeah. It's something you don't need to see. <laughs> yeah. You know, Move on. Hilarious. Nothing to see here. Well. <laughs> I know. So, all right. Send your hate mail to john at wordballoon.com. Shame on me. 
Well, that'll be your, you know, like next year you could be like Amazing Heroes and do that swimsuit issue, but just in fair play, a sense of fair play, you have like the old characters naked as well or in bathing suits. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, every now and then you get a Helen Mirren in a bikini and you're like, hey, nice clothes, lady. Good for you. I'm gonna, by the way, I'm editing all this up because like, I, know I'll get, I know I'll get jumped on for all this stuff. But anyway. Um, oh, all right. Another show that I wanted to ask you about, uh, Watchmen. Mm-hmm. Enjoyed it. Did you? Did, yeah, me too, man. I yeah. really, I, boy, and I'll tell you, that's as we know from the reaction to the movie. It's like, uh, are you sure you want to do that? Yeah. You know, but it was, and I really give uh, Lindelof a lot of credit for saying, "No, that's my story. We're done." Yeah. We're, I know it was a success. That's great. But well, you know I'm, what, though, here's yeah. what's more more amazing. I'm like, I, I like Lindelof stuff. I do. I was a big Lost fan. Yeah. I didn't like the ending of Lost. Okay. I didn't like the ending of The Leftovers. And I never saw the ending of Leftovers, but I agree. So with that. this was, and I I enjoyed both those shows up until, you know, where they got nearly to the point where they were supposed to explain stuff. I love the ending of Watchmen, and I think that you know it's like, to me, it's the first time that he paid off on something without. <laughs> no, I mean the, the the trouble with Lost was that Lost became a phenomenon, and I think they cheated because they kept denying, because people were guessing what it was. And sure. rather than, I mean, the, the, the double-edged sword of, of social media really is that the company wanted message boards to be chewing over this stuff, but at the same time, you can't do that and not be honest with the audience. And I think there were too many instances where they said, no, that's not it. It's not going to be what you're thinking. That's not it. That's not it. And then when yeah. they ended it, it was like, well, that's what we were all thinking but of it's course. kind of less because you kept saying and making us expect some kind of Hail Mary pass or something. That's the problem. So with, with Watchmen, they start with a premise that is a really good and a valid updating of what Watchmen was. Watchmen came about in the 80s when we were all worried about, I mean, I guarantee you, I lived through this era. You know, we, we elect Ronald Reagan. It's the old guy with his finger on the on the you know nuclear oh, yeah. button or whatever the, oh no I, so, I thought i was gonna be drafted i thought for sure i was gonna be drafted i mean all that stuff was viably in the air yes and the no nukes i mean though all the the wave of you know protests against nuclearization and and all this stuff all those ge- generally all the good treaties that came out came out because of public sentiment and and uh, protest over over proliferation of nuclear you know weapons and stuff so right. it exists in that era and our era we're back in this polarizing 60s thing where we have you know people who are happy to be identified as uh, you know nazis you know so yeah. so it is certainly a valid take in the time frame here's the major concern of the day and it truly is you know i, I think uh, just clearly a uh, targeted to that so i mean it lives in 2018 and whatever 20 whenever it finished it lives in that that time and it's a, a good up to, it doesn't make anything that the alan moore stuff or even the movie to be a lie necessarily it all exists in that same universe and it was in a a, a very effective i thought update you know sure i was no. disappointed i i kind of had a hint that he might not be doing more than one season because he made a comment after maybe the fourth or fifth episode that maybe this maybe i'm done with when i finish this so that felt like oh okay well then it made me think of it being in a fargo kind of kind of way that each season would be a different take on it and you yep. get a different creator and i still think that would be a viable thing if I mean, I don't think Watchmen was a runaway hit, though. You know, I mean, the numbers, we all, a lot of people liked it, but the audience numbers weren't like Game of Thrones. You know, if audience numbers... Well, they certainly weren't that. I can appreciate that. Yeah, but I mean, they were like, uh, you know, they were, they were drawing about a million and a half viewers per week, which is okay, okay but, but for example, Ray Donovan was just canceled on Showtime, and Ray Donovan's numbers were better than that. You know, so that's kind of a lower level for probably okay. the... The amount of money they put into a show like like uh, Watchmen is probably a borderline. So, um, but I do think it would still be something to revisit, like they did with True Detective. Maybe you have yeah. Lindelof as an executive producer, and you have somebody else who pitches a great take for uh, another aspect of it. 
you know, I think that that would be a, a viable, interesting way to continue it. You know, just don't. I understand, and yeah, if the hey, if uh, if a good creator has a great idea to yeah. move forward, and certainly I think things were left open enough that you could move yeah. forward. I mean, I still want to know what happened to Night Owl with yeah. Dan Dryberg. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's hanging out there, and of course, the way the show actually ends. Yeah. yeah. Um, but God, no, I, I mean, the performances were fantastic. And uh, and no, I think again, yeah. I mean, that's that's a high bar to, yeah. to overcome. And I think I think Lindelof did a great job. And I agree with you. It it was his most satisfying ending of yeah. all of his creations. Well, it's yeah. really tight. I mean, the whole thing is really tightly done. And what they set up in the first part makes sense and pays off. Yeah. You know? um, and again, it, it it really I felt like it really owned its its era. You know, in the same way that what uh, Alan and, and Dave. Um, Gibbons were trying to do in the original series, they were reflecting their era. You know, they were tilting sure. at their own windmills. You know, oh, they, 100%. Had, they had Maggie Thatcher and we had Ronald Reagan. And for better or worse, those things polarized people in the same way that, you know, I mean, I, I guess we live in interesting times, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, and I and believe me, I, yeah, and, I, and and yeah, the only good thing out of it is, is yeah, I'm sure a lot of a lot of creative anxiety is turning into some really great scripts and yeah. uh, well, projects. Like, and there stuff. was like in the in the to me, uh, I mean, the '80s is as much as the '70s was definitely my era. I didn't turn twenty until 1977, okay. so the '70s are very part of my DNA, but the '80s are my yeah. era, and the '80s. Was, were funny because there were, you know, like act, um, not actors, uh, music that I really liked from the 70s, well, like Don Henley and Glenn Fry, solo careers, they both made an impact in the 80s. Um, Jackson Brown, people like that. There was sure. like a whole thing where these guys were actually fueled artistically by the Reagan era and the, you know, the, yes. the different changes in social programs, all this stuff. And don't you think no no all right now here's a good peer to peer kind of question Jared don't you the, I got to be honest though and again you're right about that and and uh, seven years behind you and everything so those were my college years and and my my high school and college years and and early post college years as well that whole decade but um, that said I got to be honest there's a lot more and especially from these big names that you're just mentioning there's a lot more schlock than there was good yeah. From the, I mean, you got things like The End of the Innocence or Boys of Summer yeah, yeah. and some of those songs that I will stand by and say, no, those are great songs. Yeah. But you, know, you also got, like, all she wants to do is dance. Or, yeah. I, the one I pick on, and I always tell Franco, and you'll appreciate this, because he really liked it. I'm like, who's Zooming Who by Aretha Franklin? Shame on her. <laughs> I mean, Freeway of Love speaks for itself. But who's Zooming Who? What is this shit? And he's like, I like that song. I'm like, well, then you're an idiot. <laughs> well, mean, she also but, did Pink know. Cadillac, so you know. <laughs> right. Well, that's what I mean, man. No, that's, a big, that's, a big uh, that's hit. freeway. I love Pink Cadillac. <laughs> got, no, I mean, it, well, and it, you know, are you saying Bruce's uh, Pink Cadillac? Well, she yeah, Bruce wrote the song, but she did. She had a nice uh, hit with that. Oh, she did a cover of Pink Cadillac because I remember yeah. it being a line in where we're going riding on the freeway of love in a Pink Cadillac. No, she did a she did a uh, she had a, a version of it that was a big hit. Oh God! Yeah. Ooh. Well, see, no, here's the thing, right, though. You know, <clears throat> people. I mean, I'm, I don't think <laughs> I'm an easy critic for the most part. Um, I like stuff, and I like a lot of stuff that's probably semi generic. I'm sure I'm, I'm guilty as like everybody is about <laughs> well, that. We all are. <clears throat> but like with music. <laughs> One thing that I was always, I mean, I like stuff that I always liked. In other words, I'm not going to suddenly go, oh, well, sure. I don't like this because it's 20 years later. I still like stuff. I mean, I'm a big Tom Petty fan. I'm a big. Oh, I love um, well, Tom Petty's. But there's amazing. a lot of stuff in the 80s. I like Dire Straits. I like a lot of these I bands. I was a big police fan when they first started. And, and the funny part, though, is I've never, I've always felt like my goal as an artist or a human being is not to freeze myself in any era. Sure. So I still buy, you know, music from new artists and stuff. The only thing, honestly, I really, and it's not, it's, I, I'm not a big rap fan, you know, uh, oh, like the sure. only, my only thing, and I've, I've, I've heard rap that I've liked, so I don't dislike everything, but it's not my thing. Right. But I, sure. I still buy music. I still, uh, you know, I still buy, even older artists doing new music, but I buy new bands and stuff, and I don't want to be the guy who's you know pulling his pants up to his 
to his desk oh, totally. and saying, you know, get off my lawn or whatever. No. Um, and, and whenever anybody, I talk to plenty of people who are like, oh, you know, it's terrible, this is terrible, that's terrible, whatever. And I say, you know what, you're just, you're kind of crapping on my kids who are in their 20s. You're crapping on their time. And right. yeah, we thought things were bad in different times, and yeah, things can be bad, but everything wasn't better at any given time in the past. Oh no, nostalgia is great. Been schlock. You yeah. know, um, uh, you know, you can trade the convenience of a cell phone with being stuck on the side of the road with your car broken down, or what have you. You know, there's as many good things that you can remember. There's plenty of terrific things. So you just need sure. to. You know, you need to kind of cultivate that and not totally blame, oh, comics are terrible now. Um, they're not. You know, maybe they're, you're not the target audience, but there's still good stuff being produced. And even the stuff that you might not think is great, somebody likes it, you know? Nobody sets out to do a bad comic or a bad movie or what have you, you know? So you, you really you, you can't let the let your brain get fixed in any era that you might have been your golden age or what have you. Some people, so, it's high school. You know, they're a big sports fan. And, and again, Springsteen with Glory Days, that, that illustrates that absolutely. Really clearly. Oh, but, good Lord, yes. No, that's that song. I always point that out when I run into an old high school person that is really still stuck in the past. No, you're right about that. And also, I was going to say the same thing, that for that golden period of anybody, it's that, you know, teen... To thirty period, yeah. where you're really where you your tastes are expanding and you're really starting to cultivate those things. No, I understand. G four used to have that great uh, segment on Attack of the Show though, called "Your Childhood Sucks," <laughs> and then they, they would show like a commercial for <laughs> a ridiculous toy or right. a bad a bad movie or whatever. <laughs> but no, I completely agree with you, and I try and I try too to stay. Uh, you know, find new bands and get excited yeah. about you know new music and stuff. Uh, traditional media doesn't help because they've homogenized things yeah. to just really the hits yeah. and the experimentation they used to get uh, even in my own circles in radio and stuff. Um, and again, thank God for online uh, media because yeah. that's where the game's going. But see, even like if you have a history with radio, when again, when I was maybe a teenager, FM radio started becoming big and FM yep. was clearly not top 40. And then at some point in I would say even it was in the 80s that yes. FM stations suddenly became kind of no better than top 40s. They were kind of like the MTV right. channels, and they yeah. stopped playing album cuts, and they stopped giving you stuff that wasn't. So, you know, you're right. It's like things, but, but again, that's marketing, and that's the same thing of, 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 course of it is. you know, you want to maximize something to get the most people to buy something or whatever, sure. and uh uh, you don't really maybe shine a light on other stuff that's really well done or worthy of it because you're selling this. You know, we're just selling hot dogs this week. <laughs> you know, no one's going to. Yep, exactly. You know, you might be making some souffle over here. We don't give a crap about that. Well, we're selling hot dogs. Well, um, you're right. And I, I even think in the current comic uh, environment, when it's big event after big event, and some people are like, I've been on this ride. They're not going to stay dead. It's like, well, of course not. But. Again, you're asking for a steak meal, and you're at the hot dog stand. Right, right. And you know, and it's like you, with, you know, and that's the one thing I get from fans at comic shows is, and I, I understand I'm a nostalgia act at this point, you know, but I don't think of myself that way. I understand I am yeah. because, yeah, I'm not on a regular book. Well, that's not <clears throat> that's not something I have control over. So you know, what I'm sure. saying it's like I feel like I've been put in the in the. Uh, uh, off to the side or whatever, but when fans come up to me and they're like, "Oh, things were greater here, this and this," I understand the nostalgia for it, but I also feel kind of like, "Well, you know, I've been doing stuff. Have you read any of these things that I've done over this period of time?" I didn't stop working at the end of Power Shazam, you know, or at the end of Superman or whatever. I think that's what I'd like to. I mean, I, I think that's the one thing that everybody needs to kind of fight to shake their brain a little bit. Because it is easy to fall into that, and that's kind of like a, uh, basically like a negative path. You know, you're we started out where you you really are succumbing to this drumbeat of negativity that is out there. I mean, social media. The first aspect of social media that really drew attention was stupid cat pi pictures or or whatever. Right. But those were those were funny, right? 
sure. now we're overwhelmed with um, hate. hate and politics, and here's what terrible thing is happening everywhere, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, you have to rise above that, or you have to curate you have to curate it for yourself, and you have to say, acknowledge, this is bad, that's bad, that's bad, but it's not going to ruin my day, you know? I hear you, man. So you, gotta, no, you. you do have, you to, know, you that's have a... to pull that little positive thing out. Otherwise, you know, you might as well just, I mean, uh, not to be, be, why are you around if you don't like it? You know what I'm saying? You, right, so, if it's that bad. No, yeah, I understand. You have to find the good, good in it. Right? you got to find the good <laughs> in it because there's good. Again, like I'm telling you, I go to the comic store every week. I ask different customers. I say, what are you buying? What are you liking? Sometimes that helps me find something. And I go, okay, I'll give that a chance. Sure. You know, and and just because I don't like it doesn't mean it it's not good. It's just my opinion. And there's no, a lot I, of opinions well, again, on the internet that you know you can read, but it's like, hey, even a movie reviewer, you read a, mu- a movie reviewer. That was a good thing about the good old days when you had Gene Siskel at the Tribune or whatever. Every week I'd read yep. his reviews, and if he didn't like something, I knew where he was coming from, so I could go, right. well, he didn't like this, but I really liked it. So here's where. We di- we differ. I'm going to like this movie. <laughs> it wasn't like oh, oh totally. Absolutely. No, or, they're right. <laughs> I always point to. It's funny you mentioned Cisco because I always point to Ebert, Roger Ebert, mm-hmm. when he was at the Sun Times, and there was a bad. I just know that I ended up seeing the movie a year later on Cinemax, and it was your classic high school R rated with you know uh, boobs mm-hmm. uh, Cinemax movie. Right. And the great thing was that Ebert gave it three stars, and he's like, "Look, I'm going to tell you right off the top." This is a TNA comedy set in, in school. Right. And he's like, but for being a TNA sex comedy in school, it's a well-made one. Yeah. And that's why I'm giving it a good review. And it's like, okay. He's like, there's actually a story here. It's actually funny. And that you know, movie the kid, was. The kids are actually decent actors. I don't remember. <laughs> I truly don't remember. I wish I could. I Porky. wish I could, honestly. <laughs> right. But no, honestly, he's like, look, this is low rent, you know. Yeah. Teenagers getting their jollies seeing a, seeing this kind of yeah. movie and stuff. I'm sure it was set in college. Yeah. I'm sure everyone was over 18 in the movie. Don't, yeah, don't yeah. worry, kids. But I remember so, when... Oh, like, unlike, uh, when, unlike, do you remember? When Sylvia <laughs> Crystal, Crystal, Crystal... When Sylvia... Hold on. When Sylvia Crystal made private lessons... Oh, oh. And it was about her... About, like, it was a scam. Right. Like, she was, like, hot, sexy housekeeper. Right. And they try to get the kid to, like, have sex with her. <laughs> and, and then she's going to fake her death. And, like, get, like... Uh, they're going to get a ransom and everything. Right. Um, the kid is, like, under 18. Oh. Yeah, it is. And it's... And, it, and also, when there are just scenes of the kid, the, son, the boy, with his friends, it's like an 80s Disney movie that's spliced onto a Cinemax. Oh, wow. And it's insanely like, I, like I, I haven't seen it on cable or anything in almost ten years, and it doesn't surprise me because people would be outraged at, at, at this. I mean, seriously, oh my god, it is every negative social more out there, and like, no, no, no. So yeah, it's and then again, this is in the. I remember seeing it in high school when in the eighties. So that's so. There's a TNA movie well, what that a, I do vividly remember, and also that's funny, you know. Well, what about weird science? Movie. Remember that movie? Sure. And you think I, I, love I mean that movie. I I don't remember it very well. I remember seeing it back it's then, funny. but I'm I think of the like whenever I see <laughs> other I'm watching other John Hughes movies or something, and I see that one pop up like on an internet movie database. I'm thinking like, oh yeah, that's got to be pretty politically incorrect nowadays. Because you know the, that's a good question. Because I mean, they you never see Kelly LeBrock nude. Yeah. There is. I mean, they have the scene where they're they're showering with her, and they could have been eighteen year old right, high school right. seniors. Um. But I guess, Rob, by the way, Robert Downey Jr., yeah, yeah. one of the bad guys in. Uh, but it's just it's a, the concept, I guess. It's like, and there's oh, yeah. there's really here's the thing too, because people say, well, you know, the politically correct, we can no longer like this stuff. It's like, no, you can still like it. You just have to understand that twenty years or thirty years later, aspects of these films will be looked upon differently. You right. know, in other words, like watching a movie like, uh, you know. I wasn't even thinking about, like, uh, Working Girl or whatever. You know, Working Girl had this kind of ethic about it and everything. And it was, you know, the you know right. power struggles between people who were, like, super uh, uh, competitive. And, and, and uh, there's the, the girl who's the secretary and all. I mean, there are certain, certain movies that have aged. And then you watch them and you go, wait, they were doing this in the 80s. What happened? Why are we still fighting some of these battles now when they felt like they had been won? Well, 
you know, things go in waves, unfortunately. Yep, human nature, unfortunately. Yeah, no, the pendulum swings back and forth. And that's what we rebelled. I mean, not me personally, but that's what the 60s rebellion was about. You know, the 40s were, 30s were wide open. 40s were still kind of wide open fighting the war. The 50s, right, like the the 50s was like everybody trying to put the, you know, close Pandora's box, but you can't, you know. So right. the 60s are, yes. you know. And that happens, it seems to be, a, like a, a cycle of, uh, depending, maybe depending on who's in office at the time or whatever, but, yeah. you know, we shouldn't have to fight for, for women's rights anymore because, to me, that felt like it, that battle had been won, you know, and, and the same Agreed. is true with, with uh, civil rights. Presumably, these things should be, they should just be won. They shouldn't have, you shouldn't have to, 10 years later, still have the same uh, problems or have st- other stuff come up, but that's yeah. the good thing about. No. Like I said, that was always comics always had a conscience about that stuff, and they always felt forward thinking. Thanks, Agreed. mostly probably to the Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, and the the young the young guys who were part of that era in the seventies. Sure, know, um, Denny, Denny O'Neill, yep, sure. yep, yep, Neil certainly. Yeah, you people know. who had like kind of a social conscience doesn't doesn't have to. Again, it doesn't have to be politics. It, it it's almost just like human good human nature you know agreed but uh, no, absolutely no yeah. well i'll tell you what we should we should wrap because yeah. uh but i uh you'll have I, like a I marathon you two and a half hours you'll have the ben no that was great you'll have no, the, Jer- the Jer- ben her of podcast <laughs> no please this is nothing right, well first of all marty pasco and i will go four hours without blinking <laughs> so this is this is a teacup compared to that and Bendis and I usually go two and a half hours or so so this is you're in good company man. don't kid yourself and no that was great truly I, I love it's so funny as you know you texted me before and you're like are we just gonna wing it I'm like yeah pretty much I just I wanted to hit the fact that you did the crisis covers and then the fact that Batman 89 I meant to talk to you last year before the year was up yeah, yeah. for Batman 89 but then this is great to know that um, and again, give the title for the Marvel's uh, spinoff uh, thing it's that you did with Mar- Alan Brennan. Marvel's Marvel Snapshot Number One. Outstanding, and it, yeah, in with, just a couple weeks. Uh, Kurt Busiek is the kind of not de facto editor, but he's curating it. And Alan Brenner, who again wrote tons of great, mostly I remember Brave and Bold and all like really cool DC stuff back in the seventies. Oh, yeah. But uh, he's been pretty active in TV and stuff. He wrote it, and I pencil linked it and uh um i honestly i boy i feel bad i can't remember the colorist's name but he did a retro color job which is kind of interesting too i wasn't expecting it but uh it looks like an 1840s comic <laughs> you know that's amazing that's yeah. fantastic well and again i loved last year's uh one shot with roy on uh, on captain america yeah. and the invaders so no, it's great, and that's terrific. And anything else coming up? Well, you said you got the P. Craig Bar- Russell Sandman adaptation coming, or the yeah, the Neil Gaiman Norse mythology. Um, I think that comes out. Oh, in, that's what I meant. Excuse yeah, yeah. me. That comes. That, out, that is what I, I meant. think that comes out in May, or it starts coming out. I think it's a monthly. Um, I don't know how many issues, but I'm I'm doing like half of the or part of the first issue, and then I think a big chunk of the second one for my uh, my little chapter of, of Loki and the dwarves. <laughs> um, but it's fun stuff. It's definitely, and if you've ever read any of those, like the Norse mythology book that Gaiman did, is just really, a, uh, it's not an intense read. It's very fun. I mean, he basically did a lot of research and, and kind of came up with his, you know, not his own, totally his own version, but he he, uh, he did a nice job with it. So it's little parables of, of Asgardian stuff, which should appeal to comic fans since everybody loves Thor and, <clears throat> you know, get Walt Walt Simonson doing Ragnarok and and all that stuff right. in that in that wheelhouse. Sure. Oh no, absolutely. No, and isn't it interesting? I think uh, awareness of Norse mythology has only grown. Yeah. And not so much from the the Marvel Thor movies. I guess to a degree where maybe people are more interested in stuff. But yeah, it's it's. I'm thrilled that uh, Walt's doing Ragnarok over at IDW. Yeah, and yeah. And that's a good. That's that a great book. This book. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. But it's great that Neil did this book and that you and Craig are adapting and everything. Yep. That's That's terrific. Very cool, man. Thank well, you. Well, as hey, always great fun, and I know I'll see you in a couple months at Terrific Con. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully you're do, you're doing well health wise. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, actually, um, I am back in normal shoes. Excellent. After all the day, you saw me in the booth. That's true. You saw me in the big booth. <laughs> well, uh, do you have those bronze? Like when you're, you know, baby I still have shoes. Them. I don't know. You, I know. you know what's sad? 
you know what I am hanging on to? Because, uh, you know, uh, well, I have older older family members as well. But I was given a walker, and I did need a walker for the first couple of weeks, and I do have it there. Oh, wow. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, somebody in the family might need this. It's yeah, a good yeah. walker. Well, it's a reminder. So. Yeah, right? I mean, time, is a reminder. time moves on, and it's a reminder. It's like, wow, I got past that. That's actually pretty good. This is true. Take that. No, but thanks for asking. <laughs> that's that's nice. No, I appreciate it. Okay. But, uh, yeah, man, no, it's always fun talking, and we'll, we'll do it again. Okay, John. There you go. Jerry Ordway for the uh, couple hours. It's always great to talk to him. I never mention his uh, Power Cosmic podcast that he does with Mitch Halleck, my buddy who uh, runs Terrificon and a, a good business associate that I've uh, been doing a lot of work with over the years. And uh, Jerry does a great job on that podcast as well. So if you like what you heard here, you may want to check out the Power Cosmic. They always have great, intense conversations, just like I've had individually with uh, Jerry and Mitch over the years as well. I hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. It was all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Again, thank you, League, for your wonderful support via Patreon. Is Word Balloon worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month to you? If you think so, if you can swing it and want to help out the cause, you can subscribe to Word Balloon via Patreon. And I greatly appreciate uh, the hundreds of strong League of Word Balloon listeners, your domino mask and cape weight for you to join the cause. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the uh, Patreon ad on the front page of WordBalloon.com. But thank you greatly. League of Word Balloon listeners. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2020.